bring them out. All right, we're going to go back on the record. We are here on uh, Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. The matter is Mark D. Jensen, 2002 CF 314. Let's have the appearances, please. Good morning, Your Honor. The State of Wisconsin appears by Special Prosecutor Robert Jamboys, Deputy District Attorney Carly McNeil, and Public Service Special Prosecutor Beverly Jamboys. Attorneys Bridget Krause, Jeremy Perry, and Mackenzie Runner appear on behalf of Mr. Mark Jensen, who appears in person. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, thank you for coming back. It's a beautiful sight to see all 16 of you again back here. Um, just one comment, and um, obviously the attorneys want to put in their case the way they think they should. I think it would be beneficial for the court and the jury if we don't have a lot of videos in the afternoon. I think everybody, if I asked for a raise of hands, I think I would get 16 votes. That's um, just a statement. We only have short videos left. Beautiful. Here. There's 48 minutes left of um, Ron Cosman. Um, but after that, all the, all the video testimony right. is very short. That's good news. Okay, we're gonna continue then, I believe, uh, Ms. McNeil, it is Exhibit 15, and we're going to start it, correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, so at this point in the video, there are two question and answers that do not uh, appear in the audio. So by agreement, I am reading those into the record. This is still the testimony of Officer Cosman. Is that correct from the defense? Yes. Yes? Yes. All right. Go ahead, Ms. McNeil. So the question to Officer Cosman was, quote, Officer Cosman, your department produced in this case the records relating to prior complaints regarding the Jensen home, correct? End quote. Officer Cosman's answer was, quote, I'm sorry, end quote. The following question was, quote, your department produced records relating to prior complaints, police complaints at the Jensen home, right? End quote. Officer Cosman's answer was, quote, yes. End quote. And now or, the video will resume. All right, so that's part of the testimony. With that, we can start the video again.
I'm sorry, for some reason the sound is not playing through the TV. Take the evidence. Let me give you the numbers. Okay, so then the sound appeared to be working. Sorry, was that plugged back in? Is that what happened? No, she didn't plug it back in. Okay. Well, I think the sound came back on, so. Be back on, so I will now resume where we left off. I have with Mr. Jensen. With Mr. Jensen? Mr. Jensen. To show you Defendant's Exhibit 198. Do you recognize that as a Pleasant Prairie Police Department contact report? That is correct. A, a contact history report, correct? That is correct. And that records uh, official business that was recorded between the Jensen home and the Pleasant Prairie Police Department up to the time of Julie Jensen's death, correct? Correct. And let me, sh well, I'll, I'm going to leave 199 with you and I'll come back to those. And that's a list of the, that's the contact history report that's defendant's exhibit, I'm sorry, 198, is that right? That is correct, 198. And we begin with November 30th, 1990, and that's an animal complaint? That's correct. Do you have any idea what that was about? No, I do not. Okay. Then we have...
before um, the state is displaying the exhibit that is being testified to, which is um, 198. Thank you. Now resuming the video. On April 6, 1991, a false, <coughs> a false alarm. Would it be your understanding that that would relate to some sort of like false burglary alarm or something like that? That's what I would assume, yes. On August 13, 1991, we have the first uh, report of uh, harassment, correct? Correct. And Mrs. Jensen reported that she believed that that was committed by her former lover, Perry Tarika. True? Uh, I may have. I'm not familiar with that, with that call. <coughs> okay. You would not have been handling a call in 1991, correct? That's correct. <coughs> you are aware from reviewing your department's reports, however, that in 1990, in 1990, in January of 1992, Mr. Tarika was cited for harassment, correct? Yes, I do. And that was a case investigated by uh, Officer Hunter, who I think is now Lieutenant Hunter? That is correct. And was, is it your understanding that that was January 1992, that Mr. Tarika was cited for harassment? I believe it was. Now, Exhibit 199 that you have in front of you is a series of uh, incident reports that are clipped together. Is that correct? That's correct. And beginning with this incident on January 27, 1992, that incident involved, that was investigated by Officer Hunter, correct? Sergeant Mark Hunter, that is correct. And that simply indicates that uh, there was a request about suspicious activity, correct? Uh, it just says suspicious over. Pardon? So I believe at this point that uh, Exhibit 199 is being displayed, um, so I will display that. And now resuming the video. Okay. The, uh, the fence court is uh, suspicious of her. Well, if you look at, I'm asking to take a look at uh, 199, which has the, the incident report. Yes, ask uh, 121, which would be Sergeant Hunter's badge number, requests this incident for suspicious activity. OK. And there's nothing else that you know about that January 27th, 1992 contact? No, there's none. The next report relates to January 29th, 1992, correct? That's correct. And just two days later, and, and all, all that report says is complainant requests to see responding officer about a suspicious problem, true? That's correct. January 30, the Jensen's contact, January 30, 1992, someone in the Jensen household had another contact with the Pleasant Prairie Police Department, correct? 
Yeah, that's correct. And the subject of that contact was that uh, the department was contacted to be told that the Jensen's would be gone for the weekend, January 31st until February 2nd, and that Lori Coster would have the key to the home, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So there wasn't any incident reported, they just wanted to let the police department know that they would be out of town. Yes, yeah, so we do vacation home checks. Then February 20th, 1992, that's another report that the Jensen's were going to be on vacation for a couple days, correct? That's correct. The next contact by Julie Jensen was on June 16th, 1992. That's correct. And on that date, Julie Jensen reported that a vehicle had been parked across the street from her residence for over a month and had not been moved, correct? That's correct. And it appears from the first page of that report that the, that, that vehicle may have belonged to a Melvin Ashley, correct? That is correct. And are you aware of the Ashleys living across the street from the Jensen's? No, I'm not. You don't know anyone named Ashley? No. The next contact is May 8th, 1993. And what was reported on that day is that the complainants, the Jensen, state they believe someone is entering their residence and moving items, correct? Correct. Do you know anything further about that incident on May 8th, 1993? No, I do not. Do you know whether any fingerprints were taken at that time? No, I don't know. And also on that... So I'm going to pause again and display for the jury um, that Exhibit 198. And now resuming the video. There's a request for extra patrol that would appear to relate to the suspicious activity about the items moved in the house, correct? That would be correct. Do you know whether items were actually moved in the house? No, I do not. The next contact on November 4th, 1993, that's your first contact with Julie Jensen, is that right? That is correct. And all that was reported at that time was that there were some annoying phone calls, hang-ups, and harassment, correct? That is correct. On October 21st, <laughs> 1994, Julie Jensen called because two black males were selling magazines in her neighborhood, is that right? That's correct. And then the next incident on October 22, 1994, Julie Jensen again called the Pleasant Prairie Police Department because there were two black males in her neighborhood selling magazines, correct? That is correct. And that was investigated and, and they were told that they needed to obtain a permit, correct? That is correct. On December 25th, 1994, Julie Jensen called uh, requesting extra patrol because her Christmas lights had been damaged. That is correct. I take it that it's not unusual uh, that kids vandalize Christmas decorations in Pleasant Prairie? Or Unfortunately, it's not a, it seems to be a problem all over. <laughs> okay. Uh, on, January 19th, 1995, there was a request for extra, extra patrol, is that right? Yes. And the report doesn't contain any information concerning what that was all about, correct? No, it does not. It does not even indicate who the investigating officer there was, correct? That is correct. This has uh, basically for all shifts. Just two days later, on January 21st, there was a complaint about a trespass to land, correct? That's correct. And it looks like a Christopher Martin was cited for trespass to land, correct? 
Yeah, that is correct. Do you recall what that was about? Um, no, I do not. I know Sergeant um, Becker investigated it. All right. I just received a <coughs> report. Let me show it to you. And I, I believe I wrote a short supplement on it, but I'm not 100% I'm not positive. Oh, it's uh, trespassing. <coughs> Let me show you Exhibit 200, Officer Cosman. And if you could just go to the second page, that fax cover page, is not really necessary? And is it is it correct that the January 21st contact relates to a? Uh, a young man who is driving uh, recklessly over people's lawns and knocking down mailboxes and that kind of thing? That's correct. So that was the January 21st uh, trespass to land. Complaint. Right. And basically what, what happened in, in this particular complaint and why my name is on it, um, Julie Jensen had contacted me the following day, um, at which point I didn't know anything about this particular report. I went back and researched it on the report and contacted her and basically told her that um, she was not single out, it was not damage done just to theirs, that it was a neighborhood, that several other residences in the neighborhood had also experienced some vandalism, so it was not specifically targeted toward them. Okay. And was that the, do you know, was that the case with the Christmas lights and the parked car and the black males selling magazines? Those didn't appear to be specific contacts related to the Jensen's, right? Uh, which ones? The Christmas lights, the black males selling magazines, and the car parked across the street. Well, those were reported by her. That's, right. that's correct. But um, as basically, it was just to her of a suspicious nature. Okay. I mean, just those other incidents didn't appear to be targeted at the Jensen's for no. harassment. Definitely not. Then we have an incident on May 27th, 1995, uh, boat wheel, there's two of them there, harassment and extra patrol. We don't have any information, there's no report concerning what happened that day? Uh, I don't believe so. Then we move to August 25th, 1995. And there is a report that you wrote regarding uh, activities of that day, correct? That is correct. On direct examination, you were shown a, uh, a, a photograph, correct, by the prosecution, a pornographic photograph? Yes, I was. That relates to this August 24th, 1995 report, correct? August, the August 25th, yes. August 24th? I, just to be clear, I think it's August 24th. Oh, I'm sorry, it's it is 24th. Is 25th. Oh, well. well, I, have, well I have written on, on the 24th. Okay. So there's a little bit of discrepancy between the face sheet and the narrative, narrative report that you wrote. Well, I think what happened here is because there was um, actually a lapse of a couple of days when this occurred and when I was called. Okay. And you, you first received a telephone call from Julie Jensen on August 24th, correct? Correct. And what she reported on that date is that she and her husband left their home together at about 7.30 on August 23rd, 1995, correct? That's correct. And she said that when they returned home together 45 minutes later, the garage door was open, right? Correct. And she was positive that the door had been closed when they both left together, correct? Correct. And at this time she stated that they had been receiving some recent harassing telephone calls, correct? Correct. On this occasion, uh, the 
Jensen's turned over uh, several photocopies of pornographic pictures that they had found inside the boat, right? Yes. And the photograph that had been found on July 3rd, 1995 in, in Mr. Jensen's truck, correct? Correct. And that was on that, it's on, it's a, it's on Kodak paper, correct? The one is, correct. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Which, which would be the state exhibit? Exhibit, exhibit 190, exhibit 197, correct? Correct. That appears to be a developed photograph? It appears to be. As opposed to being clipped from a magazine or being downloaded or printed from a computer or anything else, it looks like it's a developed photograph. Correct. That photograph, no one would mistake the woman in that photograph for Julie Jensen, right? No. And, and there was no claim that that was Julie Jensen in that photograph. In, that, in that photograph, no. You indicated on direct examination, Officer Cosman, that that was the only photograph that, that had been received that wasn't a photocopy? That is correct. Well, <clears throat> do you recall an instance in which Mrs. Jensen called you because some photographs had been left that she was confident depicted her? That's correct. There were photographs that depicted her engaged in oral sex? They were not pictures of her, but she felt that they were of her. She reported to she reported to you that somebody had left photographs of her engaging in oral sex, correct? Uh, engaged in, in having sex. Oh, they were it was sexual intercourse, not oral sex. I believe so, yes. Weren't those photographs? They were the same as all the other in black and white and appeared to have been photocopied. Now when you say they were the same, you mean they were the same, the same picture or white. just the same type? Same type. But Julie Jensen called you and she said, this is a picture of me engaged in sexual intercourse, right? She said she had photographs of that, that is correct. Did she show you those photographs? She had them sealed in an envelope. Did she show you them? No, she did not. You never saw those photographs? I did see them. I advised her. She was very embarrassed about handing the, the pictures over. And when I got back to the department, I opened up the envelope and I looked at the pictures and determined it was not Julie Jensen engaging in, in any kind of sex that they appeared to be pornographic pictures of the same content in black and white being on regular paper. When you say regular paper, you mean? Well, meaning like, like this. correct. Not something you would see on a, of a back of a developed film as in the state exhibit. So Julie Jensen asked you not to look at these photographs, is that right? I advised her that I would have to look at them and see if it was indeed her that was in the photographs. Let me, let me back up and make sure I have this straight. Julie Jensen called you on the phone, first of all, right? Correct. Did she tell you what she wanted when she talked to you on the phone? She asked me if I could stop by and pick up some pictures that she had, um, apparently of her engaged in um, having sexual intercourse and wanted to turn them over to us. When was this? Um, I don't recall the exact date. Is there any report regarding this incident? No, there is not. When you responded to her telephone call, she told you that the photographs were of her engaged in sexual intercourse, correct? And she believed were her, correct. She said that she had looked at these photographs and she thought they were her, right? I don't recall if she said she had looked at them or not. I would, I would assume that she had looked at them, but when she handed them to me, they were in a sealed envelope. 
And she gave you the sealed envelope and her initial instructions were, I don't want you to look at these, correct? Well, I, I advised her, she asked me if I had to look at them. She did not request that I not look at them. Didn't you just tell me that she requested that you not look at them, oh, Officer I, Cosby? If I did, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I mistakenly said that because she basically wanted to know actually if they were of her or not. She thought they were. She was embarrassed by the whole situation. Do you know why it is that Julie Jensen could not determine whether it was a photograph of herself engaged in sexual intercourse and that she'd have to ask you? I, I can't offer you an explanation on that. And at least initially she was trying to give you it to you in a sealed envelope so you wouldn't look at them, so you wouldn't be able to confirm it, right? Well, I think she, I don't, I don't know what her logic would have been for, 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 basically what she told me is they were photographs given to her by Mark. Now, whether she had viewed them or not, I, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not 100% sure if she actually put them in the envelope or they were given to her that way and she did not look at them. Well, she told you that she thought they were her, right? Yes, she did. And she told you it, it wasn't as though... Uh, Mark told her that he had made those, right? Correct. She didn't believe that they were photos of her having sex with her husband, right? Right. She believed that they were her having sex with her former lover, right? With someone. Would, did she tell you that she had more than one affair? She told me of just a, just the one affair. And that was that was with Perry Tarika, correct? That is correct. You did not look at these photographs with Mrs. Jensen? No, I did not. She asked that I not look at them in her presence. She was very embarrassed over her. Well, after you looked at them and concluded that they were not her, <coughs> didn't you go back to her and show her and say, these aren't you? I called her on the phone. I did not go back. <coughs> How is it you determined that it was not her when she herself thought that it was her depicted in the photos? Because the very first picture that I saw depicted a man <laughs> on top of a woman engaged in a sex. Both the, basically from the middle of the back up to the, to the head of the male were visible. His arms were <laughs> straight, like on the bed, and a woman was underneath him looking directly up. So there would have had to have been someone standing above them taking a picture in a downward motion. And with the way she was looking, she would have had to have noticed that someone so, was there taking a picture of her. So you did not conclude that, let me try this again. Your conclusion that this was not Julie Jensen was not based on your view of the woman's face. It was based on that as well. But what you, what you just told me is that your conclusion was based on the camera angle, well, right? Well, on the camera angle and the fact that in, in the rest of looking at the rest of the photographs, they appeared to be close, but they were not all the same woman. So they were in... They were not, in, in the other photographs that were depicted, they were definitely not Julie Jensen. Well, Julie, <coughs> Julie Jensen had these photographs in her possession, true? Objection, this has been asked and answered several times. It's foundation. Well, it's pretty clear that, that she did. Yep. <clears throat> Ask a question. Julie Jensen believed it was her. Objection, right? asked and answered. Several times it's been asked and answered. Uh, it does seem to be abundantly clear from the record. Did you save these photographs so anybody else could determine whether this was Julie mm -hmm. Jensen like she thought it was? No, I did not. A camera could have been set up at that angle in her home when she was having sex with her lover, true? It would have had to have been hung from the ceiling. Well, 
there would be other ways to have that camera above them, correct? I'm not, I, I'm not sure what you're driving at, Ponce. And you don't know whether her former lover set up such a camera, correct? No, I don't know that for a fact. You weren't there, right? That's correct. And Julie Jensen would have seen the same camera angle as you, right? Right? I'm sorry? Julie Jensen would have seen that the photograph was from the same camera angle as you did, correct? Correct. And she was a smart woman, right? I felt she was. And she didn't figure out on her own? And again, I'm not 100% positive that she viewed these pictures. In 2002, the defense, defense counsel requested that you provide any photographs that you have uh, relating to any other harassment, correct? That is correct. And the first time any photograph was produced was the photograph that's one, uh, is exhibit 197. That's the first, that's the only photograph that's been produced, correct? That's correct. And that was not produced until August of 2007? That's correct. So it took over five years to find that photograph? Yes. And no other photographs exist? No. They were entered into evidence because there are indications. This one as well with the report I did, uh, the bottom line reads off my report, all photos were placed in evidence under PR number 2008. And apparently that's the only photograph that was kept for whatever reason. <clears throat> October 7th, 1995. There's another report involving your department from Julie Jensen. Is that correct? October 7th of 95. One I hear is August 25th. And the next one after that is um, October 6th. I'm, I'm sorry, you have when August? You August 25th, that was relating to the last. That was incident. the one, right. And then we have October 7th, 1995. True? I don't have a copy of that report here. Last one I had, which is August 25th. That's the next page. And then the next one after that is October 8th. Yeah, October. Or October 6th. Yeah, October 6th. That's what I'm asking you about. Okay. <clears throat> well, you can, you can see that on the uh, exhibit behind you, it says October 7th. I guess it says involvement, October 7, October 7, 1995, on the one-page report that you have associated with that? Yes. And that was uh, investigated by Officer Paul of your department? Yes. That's and the officer that was assigned. Okay. And that's just a house property check? Yes. Do you know, have any idea what that was regarding? It may have, I don't know. It may have just been that he called out on, that he was on an extra patrol and it, it happened a good time. Now, the next, the next incident reported was on February 13th, 1996, correct? Correct. 
And that was investigated by yourself and Sergeant Ratsburg, true? Correct. And on that occasion, Julie Jensen called Ameritech, right? Um, I'm sorry, I, it looks I like... Believe, I believe at that point that um, Detective Rasberg had called Ameritech. Okay. And what had happened was there was a trace on the phone at that time, correct? I'm not aware if it was a, a trace or at that particular point if we were able to contact Ameritech and have them look up a, you know, a, a particular call that occurred on whatever date at whatever time. Julie Jensen had received that. Julie Jensen had reported that their home had received a harassing phone call. Correct? A prank call. Correct. And they reported the phone number from that harassing phone call. Correct? Ameritech did apparently. Okay. And a, there was a phone number associated with that. Correct? That's correct. It established that somebody had made a telephone call to their number at that time. Correct? Correct. Someone. Uh, from the residence of Tina Thomas, correct? It appears that way. And then there was an investigation and, and nothing happened as a result of that investigation, correct? That appears so. And certainly there was no connection to Mr. Jensen making that phone call in that instance, right? Yeah, that's correct. There was actually another telephone number that was established as being the source of that phone call, right? Correct. On February 16th, there's a, a request for extra parole, patrol rather, that, parole. that could be that could be just for vacation? Vacation home be. check or uh, may have been more photographs that had been found. It, it could have been for anything. August 12th, 1996, we have another request for extra patrol. Is that right? That is correct. And that again may have just been for vacation type thing, right? I'm sorry? That again may have been just for a vacation type situation? That's correct. And then these last two contacts are the contacts that you've testified about that relate uh, to your going to Mrs. Jensen's house after she left the voicemail, right? Correct. And December 3rd, 1998, which is the date that Mrs. Jensen passed away. I correct. don't have those here, but I would, I would assume that is, that is correct. Well, you, you know that December 3rd, 1998 yes. was the yes. day she that passed away. Are you aware, Officer Cosman, that um, during the search of the Jensen home that Julie Jensen had logs indicating that she reported phone calls during the period of that tracing equipment was put on the telephone line? I was advised that she, she had kept notes. Are, are you aware that of whether those notes reflect that telephone calls were made during the time tracing equipment was on the phone? Um, I don't believe that. All, basically, the, the log that she kept indicated all calls. And I think there may have been gaps in there where she had traces put on where, the, where she didn't receive any calls. Most of the calls that she did receive that she did log and my belief is were either hang-ups or um, something of a nature where she didn't know the person that she was talking to or the person who would actually call. That is, she, <clears throat> she logged a number of instances in which she picked up the phone and there was dead air or somebody hung up, something like that. Correct. In your experience, that isn't unusual that any of us might get calls where there's dead air or hang up, correct? Correct. But she logged all those over a period of time. Correct. But are you, <clears throat> did you examine those, that information? No, I did not. Okay. 
So you don't know if calls were received during the time tracing equipment was on? No, I do not. Did you ever get local telephone records from Ameritech to show, uh, to try to establish whether calls had been made? No, I did not. Do you know whether at that time uh, Ameritech or whoever was, was it your understanding that Ameritech was the local telephone I believe it provider? was at that time. Did you know whether Ameritech as the local phone provider could obtain uh, phone records that originated in some other area code or state? No, it would have to be within the same. That was my understanding. It would have to be within the same state. So if she was receiving harassing telephone calls from Illinois, they wouldn't be able to get those records of those calls? It would be, I, I, I believe my understanding was it would be stated like something out of area or something similar to that to where they wouldn't be able to trace where it, keep, where it originated from. So an out of, your understanding was an out of area call would relate to some, some call from a, a different state or a different area code or either one? I would assume it would be a different state. At any time, did you try to take any fingerprints from any of these photographs that had been placed at the Jensen's? No, I did not. Did you ever actually try to install a, a wire tap to see to record calls that came in? No, we did not. Did you ever try to stake out Mr. Jensen's place of employment to see if someone came and left the photograph on the truck? No, I did not. It's fair to say that any leaving of photos was pretty sporadic, right? Correct. It wasn't a daily thing by any means, right? No, it was not. I presume your office would not have had the resources to maybe wait a month to see if somebody left a photograph on, a, on his vehicle? No, we wouldn't. It also, you're aware that it would be pretty expensive to hire a private investigator to do the same thing, correct? That's correct, though we did suggest that to them. You can understand how the expense would really roll up if they had to wait 30 days or something before a photograph showed up on the truck. Oh, right? absolutely. Did you, you never talk to the neighbors after having this conversation with Julie Jensen? No, I did not. Did you ever talk to Perry Tarika, Julie Jensen's former lover, in person? No, I have not. Not up until knowing that he was here. I, other than that, this is the first time I had talked to him was yesterday. I had never talked to him beforehand. Whether in phone, on the phone, in person, anything else until yesterday. That is correct. That's more than ten years since the last time something had been reported in, a, in the nature of harassment at the Jensen home. Correct. Correct. Did you ever check with the people who worked at Mark's office to see if they had seen anything? No, I did not. Did you ever check phone records from Mark at his office? No, we did not. Our understanding was there were, there were uh, numerous lines from that office that would have been very hard to get uh, the records of. Well, did you try at all? I believe, I believe someone did. I'm not exactly sure who, but I, I recall being told that. At any rate, you're not aware of any records ever being obtained for the phones, correct? That is correct. I take it that Exhibit 197, you don't have any evidence that Mr. Mr. Jensen obtained this photograph, right? No, I don't. do not, other than the fact that um, it was given to me on that date by, by Julie Jensen. And they told you that this had been left on his, on his truck, right? That is correct. Did you ever, at that time in 1998, there were uh, several um, stores that specialized in selling pornographic items in the Kenosha area? There were stores. In Kenosha County? Yes. On I-94 and on Highway 32? Yes. And uh, did you check with any of those stores to see if they had any materials like this or like any of the other materials that you had? No, I did not. 
And out of all these particular acts of, of harassment that were reported to you, can you identify one single incident that you have proof that Mark Jensen committed? No. All I have is suspicion. Based in, the, only, the only fact, if you want to call it a fact, would be that whenever we put a trace on the line, the phone calls would mysteriously stop. And it was only three of us, three people that knew that a trace was being put on the phone. That was my own, then that, that's what basically gave me a suspicion. But as far as proof, no. And as to the photographs, you have absolutely nothing, right? Correct. Your only source of information as to whether Julie Jensen told Mark Jensen was Julie Jensen, right? Correct. You didn't ask Mark if Julie told him, right? That is correct. You didn't check to see whether uh, her reports indicate that some calls were received during the trace, correct? Correct. As you've acknowledged, many of these telephone calls were nothing more than hang-up calls, correct? Correct. And when there was an out-of-area call, whether there was a trace or not, there was no way to determine where it came from, correct? Correct. So that was an additional problem in terms of your being able to track source of calls, correct? Correct. You are aware that when she logged these things, there were a substantial number of out-of-area calls, true? Correct. Did you ever try to contact Illinois authorities to see whether they'd be able to assist in determining whether the calls originated there? No, I did not. That's all I have. Hey, direct. I forgot the exhibit. Did you have um, these, what were the reports? The part, what was the exhibit on the report? Oh, I think 198, 199. Uh, do you still have those? Well, do you have those that move in front of you? The, um, all reports, the packet reports? Yes. Turn to the one uh, for August 25th, 1985, please. Which one? August 25th, 1995, date and time reporting. Received a call from Julie Jensen, correct? Well, when she was speaking to you and you responded, yes, she didn't say we found the photo. No, she? she no, she said Mark had found them. <coughs> she said her husband had found the photo. That is correct. Tell us what. Well, do you remember what she said to you if, without looking at the report? Is it basically Mark had found photographs? At the time that you prepared this report, was the matter still fresh in your mind? It was at that point, yes. Okay, read it now, please, to yourself. Oh, where is it in? Well, uh, start at the second paragraph, though. Uh, one begins to report. RO did respond.
Okay, she she basically advised me that um, her husband had gone out to the garage to work on the boat and found photos in the boat. And she also gave me one that appeared to be uh, developed that her husband had found on his truck. On his truck or in his truck? In his truck. On July 3rd, 1995? That is correct. And that's this photograph that has been marked as Exhibit 197? That is correct. And it, the handwriting of the bankers is 7395, found 7395 in truck. That's whose handwriting is that? It appears to be Julie Johnson's handwriting. Over the years, as you responded to these complaints of, about the photos in particular, um, was it predominantly photos that Mark Jensen had recovered or photographs that Julie had found? Um, they were basically what, what Julia told me is that her husband had found photographs around the residence, being outside near the garage, the front door, on the deck, and even in her shed in the backyard. Julia, Julie Jensen had told me that her husband had fallen. I don't recall her ever telling me that she had fallen. And as far as these harassing phone calls, were they all hang-up phone calls, or did she complain about any other types of phone calls? To her, they were all basically just hang-up calls, or someone would, would not say anything, there would not be any noise in the background, there wouldn't be any other heavy, heavy breathing or anything like that. Um, at times they were just hang up or dead space and she would hang up on them. That's when she answered the phone. Were there, did she ever complain of any instances where her husband answered the phone and complained of any speaking? She, she had advised me that Mark, or her husband had received calls at work where he had discussions with a particular person of whom they did not know who it was. Now at the outset of these um, harassing phone call activities and harassing activities, you had told Julie to keep a log? Yes, I did. And did she keep that log? Yes, she did. Did she show you that log from time to time? Um, no, she did not. I think rather good. Any question? In terms of uh, who found the photographs, that's information you received from Julie, correct? Correct. In terms of what happened when she answered telephone calls, that was information you received from Julie, correct? That is correct. And she was keeping tabs not just on hang-up calls, but anytime somebody had a wrong number, uh, right? That would be something else you'd keep track of? I found it out afterwards, yes. <clears throat> she kept track of any phone call that wasn't um, obviously for one of the Jensen's basically, right? That is correct. Those hang-up calls happened at all times of the day? Mostly during the day when uh, she was home alone. They happened at all times of the day she recorded hang-up calls, right? Right. That's all. Any questions? No, you Are you moving uh, 15 in? I am. Right, 15 will be received. All right, what's next for us? Steve, call Dave Nearing to the stand. What number is that? Fifty-two. Thank you. All the way up here, sir. <laughs> you 
would just remain standing, raise your right hand. You saw them swear the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, not but the truth shall be God. I do. Thank you. Get as close as you can to that microphone, the smaller one. Spell your first and last name for the reporter. David, D-A-V-I-D, Nearing, N-E-H-R-I-N-G. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Nearing, <clears throat> do you know a person by the name of Mark Jensen? I do. Do you see him anywhere in this courtroom today? I do. <clears throat> Could you point to him, describe what he's wearing? Eyes over there wearing the headphones. I request the record show the witness has identified the defendant. All right, the witness has identified Mr. Jensen here in open court. Can you tell the jury when and where you first met Mark Jensen? Uh, I first first met him around 1990 or 1991 when I worked at Prudential Bay Securities in Milwaukee and uh, Mark had joined the company around that time. So at that, when did you first start working for, for Prudential Bach? I believe 1987. So by the time... <coughs> Mark Jensen had joined in 1990 or 91. You'd been there for three or f for four years or so? That's correct. And um, after Mark Jensen joined the firm, did you and he become better acquainted? Yes, we did. We became friends. How often would you speak to him on a daily or weekly basis? Uh, both, many times daily and all week long. How would you describe your relationship with him? It was good. So was it a friendship or a business relationship or both? No, it was a friendship. I got to know his uh, wife and, and son, and we did things socially. Do you remember a time in 90 or 91, shortly after Mark Jensen joined Prudential, back walking into his office and finding something on the desk? I do. Tell the jury about that. Um, it was a smaller... 8 by 10, 8 by 12, uh, stenographer's notebook. And uh, inside of it, uh, the entire thing was uh, sketches of uh, penises. Judge, I move to strike as irrelevant. What's the relevance, Mr. Jambos? Well, Your Honor, um, the defendant's preoccupation with penises is going to be central to a good portion of the other ex-evidence in this case. It was the defendant, there's going to be testimony that uh, there were 2,200 penis photos found on Mark Jensen's office computer. And many of these photos were of the sort that were being left around the residence from 91 through 98. Um, and the, a point of contention is that the defense is saying that it wasn't Mark Jensen that was leaving them there. And the state has clear evidence that it was Mark Jensen that produced them and left them around there. And this evidence here further reflects the defendant's preoccupation with penises. Furthermore, there's going to be testimony from his, uh, from Kelly, well, her name was Kelly Labonte, then Kelly Greenman, then Kelly Labonte again, then Kelly Thank Jensen, you. in which she also testifies about Mark Jensen examining her in great detail about Judge, each and every penis she'd ever I seen. To this all being brought out in front of the jury. My objection was relevancy. I'm not asking about what every other witness for the rest of the trial is going to say. Um, the, the relevancy objection is this witness talked about sketches versus photos. I don't understand the relevancy of something that happened from 1990 or 1991 as it relates well, to another. Going back, folks, but I apologize for your uh, early break here. All right, the uh, jury is outside the courtroom. Um, Ms. Krause, you indicated you object to what was said in front. I, I don't know what the lawyers are going to say, so I, I wish I could. <laughs> I understand. 
understand that, but my objection was not a I know. speaking so objection. You can continue. Go ahead. Judge, I guess my concern is this. According to what I've heard this morning, and this is the first time the defense has been notified that Mr. Nearing was going to say this, um, was this morning. And allegedly this book that was found was like handwritten drawings of penis pictures. There's nothing in the rest of this trial that indicates that there is anything that matches these handwritten drawings to photographs of someone having sex or performing oral sex. Um, so I just don't see the relevancy of something that happened in 1991 with handwritten drawings if it actually happened. Well, if Mr. Jambois can tie it up, I, I think it's relevant to the photos. I don't know if he can tie it up. And that the only way we're going to find out is through this witness now. So, well, through this witness, Your Honor, and other witnesses, and and just it should hardly come as a surprise that we're going to be talking about penises in this trial. That in Jensen two, the court of we the are field Jensen is, three for the record. Right? I know, I know, we're on Jensen three. But if you go back and read Jensen two, uh, the court of appeals decision, the word penis appeared 115 times in that decision. I'm pretty sure that set a new record for court of appeals decisions in the state of Wisconsin. Um, Mr. Jensen's preoccupation with penises is a, is a major part of the state's case. It demonstrates why the defendant was so, up, was so upset about this one affair that Julie had had with, Mar, with, with this um, Perry Tarika, that it, 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 it occupied him throughout the course of his entire relationship with her. And Mr. Nearing will testify that he never forgot about it. It's something that bothered him throughout the entire time that he knew Mark Jensen, and it ate away at him. We just had testimony the other day from Ed Klug, in which Ed Klug testifies about there being penis drawings at, a, at this drunken party at the Marriott Hotel in, on November, uh, November 5th, 6th, or 7th of 1998. Um, Kelly Labonte, uh, or I don't know what her last name is right now, but when she testifies uh, later today, she's going to testify about Mark Jensen examining her about the size, shape, and circumference of every penis she'd ever seen. And we have his notes that he took when, during that conversation, and they're going to be introduced into evidence. And those are also penis drawings that Mark Jensen uh, did, that he produced. So Mark Jensen's very bizarre, strange, unusual, um, preoccupation with penises, and penis drawings uh, is very much a part of the state's case. And um, it does tend, and, and then along with his 2,200 penis photos that were in his office computer, um, draws, it, it will afford the jury the opportunity to draw the most very reasonable inference that it was Mark Jensen was the source of these photos that were being left around the residence. We're also going to hear testimony about Mark Jensen assuming the identity of other people while on the internet. Uh, so he did this with, uh, there's going to be testimony about that when Jason Ruff testifies. Uh, he's the computer expert, where Mark Jensen manufactured an email with a bunch of penis photos attached to it and made it look like it came from Turtle to Julie Jensen, when actually there's a, the evidence will show that Mark Jensen manufactured it, created it, sent it to himself, then deleted his name from the from folder and, fr and from the to section, replacing them with Turtle and Julie Jensen, respectively. Um, there's going to be testimony about how, when he was working at Stifle Nicholas, and Mark Jensen was the office manager at, uh, at Stifle Nicholas, or the senior vice president at Stifle Nicholas in the Racine office, that um, he was sending emails to uh, Barry Peterson uh, using the moniker quote, warm Irish eyes, unquote. So he, he as, as though Barry Peterson was receiving these emails on this dating app, and it looked like it was coming from a person named Warm Irish Eyes. And this, these photos, all, these emails also contained penis photos. And questions like, is yours as big as this, or things of that sort. It just shows a very strange, bizarre, preoccupation with penises. And um, that's very much a central part of the state's case, especially with regard to other ex-evidence. Go ahead. I don't think it's relevant. I don't think it goes to whether or not Mr. Jensen committed a first-degree intentional homicide. 
Um, that's the argument that I'm making. I understand that the court is saying that there might be a link up. I guess my concern is if there's no link up, it's already out. Well, I think it's relevant, and I'm only going to say it once. I think there's so much penis evidence in this case. It's already been directed through the video. There's already been pictures. Um, and I did read Jensen, too, and the Court of Appeals mentioned it numerous times, more than any other case I've ever seen. Um, and I think the issue is the weight of the evidence, and that's something for the jury uh, and the defense is free to argue that later. Uh, and let the jury decide whether this evidence has any bearing here. But I think it's an issue that's been presented now by the state, and I will allow it. So let's bring back the jury, and we will continue. Judge, if we're going to have further, uh, hang on. If we're going to have further arguments in front of the jury about other witnesses' testimony, I would ask that that be outside the presence of the jury. I, think I, I agree with you, but I didn't know yeah, what know. Mr. Jim was, was going to say. I would say this, that the kind of, a, when you raise an objection on relevancy, it's kind of an invited response that the prosecutor is going to explain why it's relevant. Um, so I suppose you could ask for a sidebar, but if you're going to object on relevance grounds, um, then are we going to immediately break? Because uh, I, I was just and I was just responding to the objection. I think that if we're going to, going to go into what other witnesses are going to testify, then the prosecution should have asked for a sidebar. My objection was simple. I did not go into it more because I wasn't, um, I didn't think I should do that in front of the jury. I agree. And, I, and um, if it's relevance, I'll let you know whether I'm going to sustain it right away or we need more argument. So we're all on the same page. Okay. You, all right. Bring the jury back. You can have a seat. All right, have a seat, folks. Thank you for your patience. Ladies and gentlemen on the jury, we're going to continue. The uh, objection's been over overruled, so Mr. Jamboys, you can ask your question. <laughs> 
Thank you, Your Honor. So, <clears throat> Mr. Nearing, um, can you please tell the jury uh, what you found when you walked into Mr. Jensen's office that one day when Mr. Jensen was not in there? Yeah, there was a uh, six by eight, eight by 10 stenographer's notebook. And uh, it was filled with uh, sketches of penises. Each page had a different illustration. And were there, do you remember any notes uh, or notations or anything about the penis photos? Or Not penis that I recall, it was just, just, just sketches. And do you have an estimate about how, num how many there were, how many different penis? Uh, the notebook seemed to be filled with them. And this was within the first year or two that after you'd met Mark Jensen? Yeah, first year or two. Um, did you and he ever discuss that notebook? No. Um, do you remember why you'd gone into his office that day? I do not. You weren't in there to snoop around, though. You'd just gone in there for some reason. You just don't remember what it was? No, I don't recall, but no. So you indicated that uh, as you were first getting to know Mark Jensen, you and he would socialize together? Yes. Did your families also socialize together? Yes. What were the kind of things that you and your you and your family would do with him and his family? Well, in the winter, we'd go up to uh, Door County for a weekend for cross-country skiing. Um, we'd also take uh, weekends uh, for bicycle trips with both families. And, of course, we'd have uh, dinner at one another's homes over the years as well. So over the course of years, you not only got to know Mark Jensen, you also got to know his wife, Julie? That's correct. What was your impression of Julie as a mother and as a person? Uh, great on both accounts. Uh, she was a uh, caring and loving mother, and um, she, she came across that way uh, in every situation. Now, at some point in 1998, you left Prudential back and you joined Stifle Nicholas. Can you tell us about that? That's correct. Um, a couple of the top people at, uh, repeat your question, please. So at some point in 1998, you left Prudential Bach and you joined Stifle Nicholas. Is that true? No. Um, I went from Beish to Robert Baird. Oh, from, okay. So, and then how long, when did you go from, uh, Baig to Robert Baird? How long? Yeah, how long? When, when, well, when was it that you went from Prudential back to uh, Mike Robert Baird? Yeah, I think it was around uh, uh, 80, from 87 to 92, 93 that I was at uh, Prudential Beige. And then I went to Baird. And then from 92, 93 to 98, I was at Baird. And after 1998, uh, we opened the uh, Stiefel Nicholas office in Racine. So when you left Prudential Beck to go to Robert Baird, did Mark Jensen go with you? Yeah, not to the same office, but we went at uh, more or less the same time. To the same company? That's correct. And which office did you go to? Um, I stayed in downtown Milwaukee, and Mark went to Kenosha. Did you continue to talk to Mark Jensen on a regular basis between 1992 and 1998? Most likely every day. So even though your offices were in different cities, you would still talk to each other regularly? Absolutely. And then in 1998, at some point, you left Robert Baird and you went to Stifel Nicholas. Is that true? That's correct. And um, did Mark Jensen leave Robert Baird and go to Stifel Nicholas at the same time? Yes. And did that alter your office situation? Pardon me? Did that alter your office situation? Um, in what way? Well, when you were with Robert Baird from 1992 to 1998, where was your office? In Milwaukee. And when you were with Stifle Nicholas from 1998 onward, where was your office? In Racine. Okay. So do you remember what it, when it was in 1998 that you left Robert Baird and went to Stifle Nicholas? Do I remember when it was? Yes. Yes. It was in the summer, June or July. And when you left your Robert Baird and you went to Stifle Nicholas, then you also moved your office? That's correct. And your office was moved to the Racine office? That's correct. And... Who else was in the Racine office with you? What other bro brokers were in the Racine office with you in, 1990, in June of 1998 when you moved there? Um, I believe when we opened the office, uh, Barry Peterson was there. 
And uh, I think that's all at the time we opened the office. Well, you were there. Was Mark Jensen there? Oh, of course. So it was you, uh, Barry Peterson, and Mark Jensen that were in that office? I believe so. And um, do you remember when you moved from Stifle, when you moved from Robert Baird to Stifle Nicholas, did you meet anybody from St. Louis, from the St. Louis office of Stifle Nicholas? Yes, there were people, I'm not sure how many, that uh, came from St. Louis to help us open up the office. Was one of those persons a, a woman by the name of Kelly Labonte? Yes. So you met Kelly Labonte when you opened your Racine office? That's correct. Um, now, at some point, did you notice anything about Mark Jensen and, Kim, and Kelly Labonte? Yeah, they, they got rather close. What do you mean by that? Uh, a, a personal relationship, if you will. What, evidence, what, what information did you see or what was it that Mark Jensen said or did that caused you to believe that he was developing a relationship with Kelly Labonte? Uh, he talked about it. He talked about her. He talked about his interest. What did he tell you about his interest in Kelly Labonte? Um, just in talking about it, you could tell it was sincere and... Well, was it a romantic interest or was it a platonic interest? No, it, it became romantic and I don't know exactly when that occurred. Did you and Mark Jensen ever talk about um, the impact this might have on his marriage? Yes, we did. Tell us about the conversation that you can recall having between you and Mark Jensen concerning the impact this affair could have on his marriage. Um, we talked about it and uh, he had mentioned that he was going to see her on weekends and such and I just uh, suggested to him that it wasn't a good idea and um, part of the conversation was always the uh, hurt and anger that he felt over the affair that his wife had had years earlier um, and in a way he was trying to use that as a justification for what he was doing and I strongly suggested to him that it wasn't a good idea. Did you ever discuss with him the the issues pertaining to child custody and what would happen if one spouse moved away with the children? Yes, we did. He was well aware that he could lose custody of the kids or that he'd have to uh, divide all of his assets in half. And how did he respond? How did he address that with you, if you can recall? Well, there wasn't any way to really uh, finalize that discussion. It was just something that was uh, talked about. Now, throughout the time that you knew Mark Jensen um, from 1991 onward, uh, how would you describe his computer skills? Uh, he, was, he was very very familiar. He had a lot of, a lot of interesting software and uh, he was very comfortable with and, and interested in computers. Um, you knew how to use a computer too, didn't you? Pardon me? You knew how to use a computer as well, didn't you? Not as well. I didn't know how to use a computer and things like that, but Mark was always uh, a step or two ahead. Whenever you'd have a problem with the computers, would you talk to Mark about it? With uh, certain business-related software, we talked about it, yes. And Mark seemed to know the answer. Mark had the answers, because it was Mark's software. Now, at some point, um, about the time you were having these conversations with Mark about the pitfalls of divorce, um, did he start talking to you about Julie, Julie's conditions? Yes, he did. And what was he telling you about Julie's condition? Um, a lot of things. He said uh, uh, that she was depressed. Um, that she didn't want to do anything, that she was losing weight. Um, he said that I wouldn't recognize her if I saw her. She had lost so much weight. Um, so when you heard him talking about Julie in this fashion, um, were you concerned about Julie? Yes, of course. So what, if anything, did you do in response to, being, to your concern about Julie? Uh, we had not seen them together in a long time because of the ongoing 
relationship that was developing with Kelly Labonte. Um, so I talked to my wife about it and asked her if she'd give Julie a call and take her out to lunch and maybe cheer her up. You remember about when that conversation occurred between you and your wife? Uh, I believe it was a week or two before she passed. And do you know if your wife was ever able to get a hold of Julie? Oh, yes, she was. And did she have lunch with Julie? Yes, she did. And after your wife had, your, had her lunch with Julie, did she relate to you what her perceptions of Julie? Objection, hearsay. Sustained. I didn't ask him what they were. I just we're getting really close. So yeah, I, I wasn't going to go there, Judge, because Sharon. I understand, but you're really close. You're, you're right on the cliff there. So let's let's ask another question. Now, during this time that Mark was telling you about Julie's condition, um, did you ever observe make any observations of things that he was doing on his computer? Yes. Tell us about that. Uh, he frequently um, was on the computer searching for what he told me were uh, drug interactions. He was trying to uh, figure out why her behavior, her demeanor um, had cha changed so much and why her health was deteriorating. And so that, That's what he was telling you. He told you that he was doing that. He told you he was looking for drug interactions, and that was the, the reason he gave you for looking for drug interactions. That's correct. Would you just rephrase the question, Mr. Chairman? So the only thing you know about why Mark Jensen was looking at these things is what Mark Jensen told you, correct? That's correct. Um, so quite aside from what Mark Jensen told you about why he was looking at these things, what were the things that you saw on the Internet, on, on his computer when you'd walk into his office? Uh, I never really saw anything on the computer. Um, you know, I'd wander into his office. We were close together. We were good friends. I'd maybe sit in a chair across from him, and he'd be working away, and I'd ask him what he was doing, and, and that was the response I would get, that he was looking up for, looking for drug interactions. So how often would you walk into his office and see or hear about him l looking at drug interactions on, on the computer? As I think back, it was very, very frequently. Um, it was both before her death and after her death. Now, switching gears to December 3rd, 1998. Were you in the office on December 3rd, 1998? Yes. And how big an office was this? How many people altogether were in the office? Uh, I mean, if you add in all the brokers and all the support personnel, how, how many people were in the office? Um, I don't know exactly how many were in there at that time. We had people that would join us and people that would leave, but you know, roughly a half dozen. So it was a relatively small office. It was a small office, that's correct. And on December 3rd, 1998, do you, have an, uh, do you remember Mark Jensen coming into the office on December 3rd, 1998? I do not. You didn't see him on December 3rd, 1998? That's correct. Um, on the morning of December 4th, 1998, do you, have any, do you recall having any conversation with Mark Jensen? Yes, Mark called me and uh, told me that Julie had passed. Did he indicate to you whether he'd be in the office on December 4th? Pardon me? Did he indicate to you whether or not he would be in the office on December 4th? I don't believe so. At some point after Julie's death, do you remember having a conversation with Mark Jensen about whether or not Kelly Labonte should be at Julie's wake or at her funeral or come into his residence. Yes, I did. Tell the jury about that conversation. Um, again, we'd have frequent conversations every day, and he brought up the issue of whether or not it would be appropriate for Kelly to be at the wake. 
And uh, I don't know if it was a, the same conversation, but shortly thereabouts, he asked if um, what my thoughts were to, if as if uh, if Julie were to move into his home. Julie or Kelly? Uh, pardon me, Kelly. So this was then a matter of days of uh, Julie's death. That's correct. And he was asking you about whether his girlfriend should come to his wife's wake and funeral that's correct and what advice did you give him i said it was not a good idea and this conversation about whether or not kelly should move into his residence he should have kelly move into this residence um how much time elapsed between julie's death and this conversation that you had with mark jensen about julie move, uh, kelly moving into his residence um, I can't recall um, exactly, but it was in very short order. It, it wasn't long. More than, a, more than a week or less than a week? Um, I can't recall, but maybe a week or two. Two at the most, I would think. And when he was asking you about whether or not you thought it advisable for Kelly to move into his residence, what was your advice at that time? Uh, rather low-key, but just uh, that it was not a good idea. Now, you indicated there was a person in your office by the name Barry, Barry Peterson. Is that true? Yes. Now, did Mark ever have any conversation with you about spoofing Barry Peterson? Yes, he did. Tell the jury about that. Um, Barry was single at the time and uh, apparently had been on a single dating site. And so Mark... <coughs> created a, uh, a person that he uh, called Warm Irish Eyes. It was supposedly a woman. And uh, he responded to or started to come on to uh, Barry Peterson as this woman named Warm Irish Eyes. So Mark would tell you about this? Yes, he did. More than one occasion? Yes. And these emails that were being sent to Barry Peterson as though they were coming from warm Irish eyes. Th these were emails that were created by Mark Jensen. Is that true? That's correct. And did you learn what these emails were, what they contained, or any attachments to these emails? Um, he would have pictures of penises and it would inquire to Barry Peterson uh, whether or not he was that big or things of that nature. And at the time Barry Peterson was receiving these emails, they appeared to be from Warm Irish Eyes. Yes. Not from Mark Johnson. That's correct. During the course of um, your employment, at Stifle Nicholas, did you ever come to know a person by the name of Ed Klug? Yes. What can you tell us about Ed Klug? Objection relevance. I don't know where this is going. Overruled, go ahead. What can you tell us about Ed Klug? Um, I believe Ed was a Robert Baird broker also, and uh, I believe Mark recruited him to uh, come and open an office in uh, Appleton for Stiefel Nicholas. Do you remember after Julie's death ever having a conversation with Ed Klug about um, any conversations that Ed Klug and Mark Jensen had had before Julie's death? I do. So do you remember where that conversation occurred between you and Ed Klug? Um, I believe the first time it was on a plane. We had both been in uh, Boston for a meeting and uh, on the way back um, Ed told me that Mark said he was going to uh, kill her. Did Ed tell you where that conversation had occurred between him and Mark? Um, I believe he said it occurred in uh, St. Louis. So 
Can you tell the jury uh, in a brokerage firm uh, the sort that you had at um, Prudential Bach and um, Robert Baird and Stifle Nicholas, is there a process or a procedure regarding the opening of mail or taking of phone calls? Yes, is they're different as far as uh, opening mail. The front office um, would receive the mail and they would always open every piece. Uh, even if it was marked personal, they'd open it uh, to see what was in it. Um, most of the phone calls also went through the uh, front office, but we did have direct lines, and so a person could contact us directly without going through the front office. Now, from the time that you first met and worked with Mark Jensen right up through December 3rd, 1998, um, do you recall Mark Jensen ever complaining or any member of the front desk ever complaining about receiving harassing phone calls or receiving uh, explicit or pornographic photos at the office? Uh, repeat the question, please. Did any support person, anybody that opens the mail, ever indicate to you that they'd received or complained to Mark Jensen that they'd received or opened in the mail uh, a packet containing pornographic photos? No. And something like that would stand out in your mind. Yes. So starting with Prudential Bach, no such no such email no such uh, photos were in the mail at Prudential Bach or Robert Baird or at Stifel Nicholas at the office. Is that true? Opened by the front office, that's correct. And all of the mail was opened by the front office, isn't that true? That's the policy. At some point after um, Julie's death, do you recall having a conversation with Mark about, um, and Mark wanting to get his home computer back from the authorities? I do. Tell the jury about that conversation. The conversation wasn't so much about wanting to get it back. It was a general conversation, and uh, he had expressed um, concern previously too about uh, them having his computer and it was a home computer but he used it for uh, business at home as well and he wanted to get it back and uh, on this particular day it was a Friday afternoon um, we were talking about it and uh, again it was you know they took my home computer he'd like to have it back and I mentioned to him that uh, Given that they had taken his computer and wouldn't give it back, I was surprised they hadn't come in and uh, taken his office computer as well. And you had that conversation on a Friday afternoon? That's correct. And you recall having a conversation with Mark Jensen the next Monday morning? Yeah, Monday morning, first thing, uh, Mark told me uh, his computer was fried. and uh, His work computer was fried. His work computer, the computer in the office, said it was fried and uh, he'd have to call St. Louis and have them send him another. Did Mark ever talk to you about possible ways in which one could fry the hard drive on a computer? Yes, uh, years earlier, and I don't remember when, but he had told me uh, when he was working at Baird, there was an individual there that he didn't get along with, and so he took a uh, large magnet and uh, applied it to the hard drive, and uh, uh, the, the intent was to uh, destroy the data on the, on the hard drive. Did Mark ever tell you uh, or talk to you about what happened when he found Julie dead? Yes. Um, what did he tell you? Well, specifically, did he tell you anything about what he did with the boys when he got home that day? Yeah, he, he said he f it felt as though something wasn't right. And so uh, I believe 
that he said he had the boys wait, and uh, he went into the house and uh, found that Julie had, had passed. So normally he didn't have the children go in the house with him. He had them wait in the car. Yeah, I would think normally. Uh, Objection I don't know. leading. That's yeah, not what Mr. Nearing said. It's well, just go ahead, Mr. Jambos. I, I don't want to tell you what Mr. Nearing, uh, what, uh, what Mark Jensen said to you. What did Mark Jensen actually say to you about the boys when he got, came, came home that day? They would asked him to, uh, to wait behind while he went in to uh, check on mom. And, um, and that's when, and what happened then after he had the boys wait in the car? Oh. Objection. Move to strike. That's not what Mr. Nearing said. Overall, go ahead, Mr. Jambos. Uh, once again, please. What, just, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So what, what is it that Mark Jensen told you about that, what he did with the boys when he got home that day? Um, once, once more, Bob, I don't understand the question. Mark Jensen talked to you about coming home that day, correct? That's correct. And what, if anything, did he tell you about what he did with the boys before he went into the house? Oh, he didn't say specifically what he did with them. What I got out of the conversation, it was he went into the house to check on Julie uh, before the boys did. And did he tell you what he, if any, how he had the, what he did with the boys before he went into the house to check on Julie? No. Did he tell you he had, he said that he felt that there was, might be something wrong with Julie and that's... Well, that's correct. He said he, something didn't feel right. He thought something was amiss. And so what did he, and he told you he went into the house and did he tell you what he did with the boys at that point? That's correct. What did he do with the boys at that point? Oh, I have no idea. Did Mark ever tell you anything about Julie getting sick while he was at the Blueprint in November of 1998? He did. Tell the jury what he told you. Um, again, I was getting the uh, constant um, stories about how ill she was and how poorly she was doing, and he mentioned that uh, she had thrown up uh, while he was gone. At the Blueprint? That's, well, he was in St. Louis at the Blueprint. That's correct. During the time that you knew Mark Johnson from 1990 or 91 through Julie's death in, Dece in December of 1998, did you ever get the impression that Mark Jensen had ever come to terms with or forgiven Julie for that one affair that she'd had in early 90 or 91? No, he was seriously hurt and uh, angered. And from very early on when I first met him, that came across uh, right up until the very end. He, he never got over it. Nothing further, Your Honor. Uh, who's doing the cross? I am Judge. Go ahead. Mr. Nearing, you said you worked with Mr. Jensen starting sometime in 1990 or 1991. That's correct. Do you remember what year it was? Whether it was 1990 or 1991? Yes. Which one was it? Oh, I, I, do not, I cannot remember. I started there in 87, and uh, we were there a couple years you know, before we left. So you were working with Mark Jensen at that location a couple of years before you went both separated and went to different offices for Baird. That's correct. So you had a lot of conversations with Mr. Jensen. Many, 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 yes. About work? That's correct. About families? That's correct. About children? Yes. And it'd be fair to say that during all of those conversations, you didn't write them down anywhere. Uh, not a word. You weren't taking notes? Not a word. You weren't writing them in a journal? No words in a journal. You guys were friends. You were just talking. That's correct. You worked with Mark at 
Prudential, you said, for a couple of years. Can you tell us what Mr. Jensen's schedule was? What time he got in each day? Um, Mark was always a, a later starter, and uh, he, he would stay longer. So his schedule, of course, was Monday through Friday, and while I might be there at 7 or 8, Mark might not get there until 9 or 10, and I might leave a little earlier, Mark might stay a little later. So it'd be fair to say there was no time clock to punch into? Never. Mr. Jensen wouldn't come by your office and say, hey, just so you know, I'm here today. No, he never came by and said, just so you know, I'm here today. But I would know he was there. His office was next to mine. We'd say hello. Because you talk throughout the day. That's correct. So you would know that he would be at work. That's correct. And that was when you were working at Prudential. That's correct. Now, at some point, you separated, and he went to Baird in Kenosha, and you were at Baird in Milwaukee. That's correct. And during that time, you continued to talk to each other. Yes. On the phone. Uh, daily. About work. Mostly. About family. That's correct. Because your families actually got together. That's correct. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit about this time when you were at Baird. When Mr. Jensen was at Baird in Kenosha and you were at Baird in Milwaukee, you would have no information about phone calls he may have received. I would have no firsthand information. That's correct. You wouldn't have been talking to the front office staff of the Baird in Kenosha? Yeah, no, I would not. You wouldn't be asking them what mail they had opened? That's correct. You wouldn't have been asking them about what phone calls they had received? Correct. That wasn't your office staff? That's correct. Your office staff was actually in Milwaukee? That's correct. And that was from sometime 1993 to 1998? That's correct. Now, you talked a little bit about these computer searches that you say Mr. Jensen conducted, correct? That's correct. You didn't see him conduct any searches. I didn't see the uh, screen, but I saw him conducting the searches. What you mean by seeing him conducting the searches, you saw his fingers typing on a keyboard. No, what I mean is he told me that's what he was doing. I understand what he told you, sir. I'm asking what you actually saw, though. What you saw was his fingers typing on a keyboard. That's correct. You didn't actually see the screen. That's correct. So I want to talk a little bit about Mr. Jensen's office in Baird in 1998, okay? Mm -hmm. um, when you walked in the door, there was like a U-shaped desk that you would see in front of you. At Baird in Kenosha? No, at Stiffel in 1998. Uh, please repeat the description. Thank you. Um, when you walked in the door of the office, there was like a U-shaped desk that you would see as you were walking in. Yes. And there would be a monitor on one corner of the desk. Is that a yes? Correct, yes. And there would be a monitor on a second corner. Yes. He actually had two monitors. Yes, for and two people. Thank you. And it would be fair to say that as you walked in the door, you could see the monitors. That's correct. Now, you said that when you talked to Mr. Jensen, you actually sat across from his desk. That's correct. And it was when you were sitting across from his desk that you couldn't see the monitors. Um, I'd sit across from him, or he had a credenza. Uh, there was the desk in front, and then chairs directly opposite. And off to the side was a, a long credenza, maybe six or eight feet long. So a lot of times I'd wander in, as Mark did in my office, and stop next to his desk, aside it, and lean um, onto the uh, credenza. So it was both, sitting across from him and sitting right next to him, standing right next to him, leaning up against the credenza. So what I asked, though, is when you were sitting across from him at, that, at those chairs, you couldn't see the monitors? No, I never saw the monitor on any of the searches. So as he was doing all of these searches that he was telling you about drug interactions, you never looked at the monitor? That's, uh, that's correct. And what he said to you was that he was concerned about Julie's change in behavior. Correct? Yes. And he was concerned, and he expressed that concern to you. Yes, he did. And he was concerned because she wasn't eating the same. That's what he said. And he was concerned, and what he said to you was that she was losing weight. That's correct. And that she would lock herself in the bedroom. 
I don't think I said that yet, but he did. He told you that? Yes. An additional concern he expressed to you was that she didn't want to do anything. That's correct. And she seemed depressed. Pardon me? And that she seemed depressed. That's correct. Now, in 1998, you and Mr. Jensen had been friends for seven years. Okay. Was Sounds about right. Say? That's correct. That's what you testified to. I'm just putting yeah, I don't a have. Yeah, I didn't have a number, but you're right. You did that math. Um, and during that time, you talked about a lot of things. We did. Personal things. Sometimes. Including Julie Jensen's affair. Yes. And how that hurt Mr. Jensen. That's correct. And how he was upset about it. Yes. And I think your testimony was he was angry about it. I said hurt, very hurt and angry. And he confided in you about those things. Yes. And when he was talking about his wife in 1998, he was confiding in you about what he saw. That's correct. So when Mr. Jensen talked to you about looking up drug interactions, I think you said he did it both before Ms. Jensen's passing and after her passing. That's correct. And that was on the work computer. That's correct. And did he talk to you about the prescription medication she had been prescribed by a doctor? Specific ones? Yes. Not that I ever recall. Did he talk to you about her con his concern about her taking an unusual amount of aspirin? No. Did he talk to you at all about antidepressants? No. I want to talk to you a little bit about these computers. Okay. You just told this jury that you had a conversation with Mr. Jensen at some point about both his home and work computers. Yes. And I think you said it was on a Friday. That's correct. What day was that? I have no idea. What month was that? Um, I, I do not remember. What year was that? Uh, I don't recall. I'm sorry. Um, and at that time, Mr. Jensen had, when he worked at Stiffel, he had actually two computers in his office. Yeah, he had a personal computer and a company computer. And used his personal and company computer for work. That's correct. And he had those computers through the time that he was arrested in this case? Yes. And you actually um, had information that his work computer had been sent to St. Louis? Um, you've kind of jumped ahead on the timeline. I have jumped ahead on the timeline. That's fair. So when you spoke to Mr. Jensen about this damage to his work computer, he advised you that he had sent it to St. Louis? Uh, that's correct. And it's fair to say that working for a stock brokerage firm, there are certain protocols you have to follow. There are departments that take care of different things. That's correct. And because you're dealing with stocks and trading and people's personal information and money, there's specific protocols you have to follow. Yes. And that's why people at the front desk open the mail. Yes. Because you need to make sure that you're following whatever protocols have been set by the company. That's correct. And the main location for most of the departments for Stifel Nicholas, Nicholas, am I mm -hmm. saying that right, sir? Yes. Is in St. Louis. Uh, that's the home office. So that's where a lot of the things happen, is at the home office. That's correct. We're just a small branch. In fact, you said you had like a half a dozen people working there. That's right. So if something was to happen with a work computer, it would be sent to St. Louis. Right. Any kind of issues that we would have like that were resolved. By St. Louis. By St. Louis. Do you remember in 2002, everyone in Stiffel Nicholas getting brand new work computers? I don't remember the year. But there was a time when everybody got an update. That's correct. Another thing that the home office can do is conduct audits on computers. I don't know anything about that. Do you know anything about the fact that they can remotely 
access your computer and see what you're doing? I assumed as much, but back then I'm not so sure. In fact, I would say no, I didn't think that was occurring. Um, sir, you testified previously in this case, correct? Yes, I did. And that was in January of 2008. You have to help me with the date. I do not remember when it was. Do you remember it being early January 2008? Um, if you say so, I, I do not remember. That's fair. Um, you were asked on page 82... line 21 and on occasion will conduct audits correct and your answer was yes um, I'm not sure of the context the branch would be audited uh, that people would come in and they'd go through stuff um, your earlier question was about did I think they could see everything we were doing on our computers and I, I don't I believe those are two different issues the exact date okay so you knew that they did conduct audits though of computers and other business activity um, they would come in and make sure records were kept properly that uh, people were not gaining access to records that they shouldn't gain access to and things of that nature I don't recall I don't believe they would have ever looked at individual computers or how they were used or what was on them. Back then, it was kind of in the early stages and we didn't have the oversight that we had uh, today or at the end. Sure, sir. On page 117, I don't know what line, 25, 24, 23, 22. Page 117. 19, 118, 17, 16. Line 16, when asked about system checks, from the home office, you received a question. Did that ever happen to your knowledge in your office? Answer, you mean a system check on computers? Question, mm-hmm. Answer, a system check by the home office? Question, yes. Answer, they routine, routine, routinely monitor various things. Um, I guess I would stand by what I said today as opposed to as opposed to 2008, which I'm was not sure what I was thinking then or what I meant. That's fair, sir. Do you still work for Stiffel Nicholas? No, I retired uh, nine years ago. So you haven't had any system checks done on your computer in the last nine years? Well, nowadays you never know. <laughs> After Julie Jensen passed away, um, you spoke to law enforcement. That's correct. And that wasn't actually until 2003? Does that sound right? Um, again, I, as I reread my testimony from the last trial, I just, I, I couldn't get my head around the dates. So if that's when I saw them or that's when I contacted them, that's correct, but I, I can't sit here and tell you it was in 2003 in this month. I just don't, it's just not in my head. That sounds wrong because it is wrong. It was March 22nd, 2002. Okay, yeah, whenever it was, I, I don't remember. You didn't contact anyone in law enforcement in 1998. I did not. You didn't contact anyone in law enforcement in 1999. Um, no, I did not. You didn't contact anyone in law enforcement in 2000. No, I believe the first contact was after Mark was arrested. I think I contacted Paul Ratzberg, Detective yeah. Ratzberg. And Mr. Jensen was arrested in 2002. Okay. 
And that's when you then contacted I Detective contact, Ratzberg. I contacted him. And he wanted to talk to you about what you knew about the Jensen's. That's correct. And what you knew about Mark Jensen. That's correct. Because you had worked for him so long. That's correct. You had had hundreds of conversations. Yes. You guys were friends. Yes. He had confided in you. Yes. And Detective Ratzberg wanted that information. Yes. He asked you questions. Uh, he did. And, he, and you answered those questions. That's correct. And you answered those questions truthfully. That's correct. And as Detective Ratzberg was asking you questions and you were answering those questions truthfully, Detective Ratzberg was taking notes. That's correct. Notes on what you said. That's correct. And if he was concerned about something you said or unclear, he would ask you to clarify it. Yes. After you spoke to Detective Ratzberg, you wrote a written statement. Okay. Do you remember writing out a statement after you talked to Detective Ratzberg? I can't remember if I wrote them or if he wrote them and I signed them, but let's find out. Things were put in written writing. Looks like a looks like a report with my initials at the bottom. So since I don't know your handwriting or Detective Ratzberg, is that your handwriting or Detective Ratzberg? I don't write in cursive. I I print, and this is printed, but. I, I'm not sure it's my handwriting. Um, it is my initials at the bottom. At the bottom of each page, there's actually a spot where you initial. That's correct. And I, that would have been after reviewing and or writing this statement. That's, that's correct. Yeah, is there a date on this? Okay. And as you and I just both saw, it was March 22nd of 02. Okay. Now, sir, you also testified previously in this case. Yes. Two times. If you say so. I do say so. Do you remember testifying two times? Um, there's a lot of it. I just... I. Don't remember. So a lot you just can't remember. That's correct. Um, one of the times was on August 28th of 2007, and the other ones were which we just talked about was January 9th to January 10th of 2008. Okay. And when you testified on those days, you actually took the stand. Correct. I remember doing that. Much like you did to, are doing it today. That's correct. You raised your right hand. Yes, I did. You swore to tell the truth. Yes. And you told the truth. That's correct. You were asked questions by Attorney Jamboys. That's correct. Um, and you answered those questions. I did. You were also asked questions by defense counsel, not I did. me. I did. Or, yes, I answered them. Um, and you answered them truthfully. That's correct. I want to talk to you about some of the statements that you just said today for the first time. Okay. You testified today that in 1990 or 1991, you walked into Mark Jensen's office and flipped through a journal. A what? Like a stenographer notepad, I think you said. That's correct. So I want to make sure I understand what happened on that day. Okay. You go to Mark Jensen's office. Mm -hmm. He's not there. That's correct. And he's not someone you've known for a long time at that point. That's correct. It's when you worked at Prudential? That's correct. And he's not there, 
So instead of walking out of the office, you go inside the office. That's correct. And you look around. No. You don't look around. You don't see a notebook. Um, and, I, and I knew you would ask me why I was there. So my question is, is did you see a notebook? I saw a notebook. And after you saw that notebook, you opened that notebook. That's correct. And your testimony today is, in a coworker's office that wasn't pres present, you started to flip through his notebook. That's correct. You never told Detective Ratzberger that. Um, I believe I did. You believe you told Detective Ratzberg that you saw this notebook? Absolutely. Sir, I'm going to show you Exhibit 16, which we agreed is your statement. Can you please take the time to review this and stop when you get to the part that you found a notebook of penis sketches? Um, I, I do believe I reviewed this, a copy of it that was texted to me, and I, you're right, it, it isn't in there, but I know that I told him. Objection, Your Honor. The counsel is interrupting the witness while he's answering. She's got to wait for him to finish answering the question before she starts speaking. Give, give him a chance to finish. I, I, thought he had finished his I understand. Give him a chance to finish. And, sir, you also had a chance, I think you testified to, that, to review the transcripts of your testimony from the last trials. I did. You didn't testify to this notebook of penis sketches then either, did you? I don't think so. I want to ask you a few questions about this Barry Peterson spoofing email that you testified about. Okay. You testified that Mr. Jensen advised you that he created an email to spoof a coworker. That's accurate. And was this when you guys were at Stiffel Nicholas? Yes. In 1998? Um, this was more like 2001, 2002. So at that point, who was the manager of the Stiffel Nicholas office? Mark was. Mr. Jensen was the manager? Mr. Jensen was. And after Mr. Jensen told you that he spoofed an employee, you went to St. Louis? Did you tell them about what the manager of the office was doing to an employee? Objection. No. There's two questions, and she didn't allow him to answer the first question before. I think it's time for our morning break. That's what I think. So and we'll continue, folks. Go on the back. Relax. All right, uh, let's try to take 10 minutes if we can. Thank you.
All right, have a seat, folks. We're back on the record on Mr. Jensen's case. The appearances are the same. Uh, Mr. Nearing is still under oath, and we will continue with the cross-examination. With that, Attorney Krause, you could start. Thank you. Mr. Nearing, I asked a really bad question when we ended there, so I'm going to rephrase it. Okay. In 1998, Mark Jensen was the manager of Stiffel Nicholas. Yes, he was. And you had testified on direct about some spoofing of Barry Peterson. Yes. So he would be considered an employee of Mark Jensen. Pardon? Or someone he supervised. Yes, he was the manager at the time. So he supervised Barry Peterson. Uh, that's correct. He supervised you. That's correct. And at any point when Mark Jensen told you about the spoofing, did you contact St. Louis and advise them about what this manager was doing to someone he supervised? No, I did not. And when you talked to Detective Ratzberg, your testimony is you told him about the spoofing? I know that I did. And you never testified about any of this in your previous trial testimony? Um, I cannot remember, but if I didn't, I, I didn't. You had a chance to review your previous testimony transcripts. It was over 100 pages. I, if I didn't, I didn't. Another conversation you talked to this jury about was a conversation that Mark Jensen had with you about, it sounded like divorce, right? Okay. It was after you learned about the affair with Kelly Labonte. That's correct. And you told him about possible ramifications. We discussed them. And what you told the jury today was that the possible ramifications you talked about was child custody and splitting assets. Correct. Now, you also testified again, January of 2008, and you were asked the question. Counsel, what, what transcript? Thank you. Page number? It's page 15. Of the, uh, of. I believe it's the first day. Let me just double check. Nine. Can you know which so date? Because there were the tenth. Two, the tenth. Mm -hmm. Okay. On what page are you on? Well, I was on a page. Now I got to find it. What did I say? Fifteen. Page fifteen. The fourth line. Hmm. Page fifteen, line four. And what exactly, and the question was, and what exactly did you tell him about the ramifications? And your answer was, you know, we talked about custody of the kids, possibilities of one spouse moving away, and things like that. Next question, did you tell him that it was a difficult position to be in in terms of divorce? Yes. And I'm going to go down to the next question. Did you ever talk to him, or did he ever talk to you about the financial ramifications like splitting money and the assets, splitting the assets? And your answer was no. I don't believe that was an issue for him. That was your testimony in 2008. We discussed this topic on many occasions. I understand that, sir. My question was, that was your testimony in 2008. Okay. Now, you testified that you knew Mark and Julie Jensen. Yes, as I did. friends. Yes. You knew Julie Jensen was from the Kenosha area? Uh, I'm not sure I knew that. Didn't know that she had lived there her entire life? That's correct. Or that her brother lived just a few miles away? I knew family was in the area, but I didn't know she was uh, born and raised there. Another conversation you talked about and talked to this jury about was a conversation you had with Mark Jensen about Kelly Labonte after Miss Jensen's death. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Okay. 
Your testimony was that Mark Jensen asked one or two weeks after Julie Jensen passed if Kelly Labonte could, should move into the family home. That's correct. And you told him that wouldn't be a good idea. Yes, I did. You never told Detective Ratzberg about this conversation about Kelly Labonte. I cannot remember. In fact, he specifically asked you about Kelly Labonte um, and Mark Jensen's relationship with her, and in fact, when she moved to Kenosha, but at no point did you tell him that Mark Jensen asked if Kelly Labonte should move into the house one to two weeks after Julie Jensen's death. Okay. Did you tell him that? Gosh, there are so many facets to this case. I don't think I touched on absolutely everything every time I sat down to speak with him. And you didn't testify to that last time in January of 2008. Testified to what? The two weeks after Julie Jensen's death conversation. Oh, it was shortly after the death, that's correct. But you didn't testify to it previously. Um, I can't remember what I testified to. You read the transcript, sir. It was over 100, it was over 100 pages. Yeah, I read it all, but just in one ear and out the other, there's so much. You were aware that in January of 1999, Kelly Labonte was still married and living outside the state of Wisconsin. I was. So I want to go back to this friendship you had with the Jensen's. I think you said it developed in 1990, 1991. That's correct. And you would do things as a family. That's correct. With the Jensen's family. Yes. Cross country skiing. Yes. Camping. Not camping, but bicycle trips. And oh, like glamping? Was that like Door County, or was that more we'd hotel? We'd stay in hotels. And when you stayed in these hotels, did you find babysitters for your children so you could go to strip clubs? Um, no, we did not. <laughs> that wasn't something your families did. Uh, no. And in 1990, when do you think the last trip you took to Door County was? <sighs> Sorry, I cannot help you with that. I, I don't know. Um, it wasn't until maybe... July, August of 1998, that you stopped having these family trips together. That's correct. And that's because you found out about Mark's affair with Kelly Levante. Yes. And you didn't want to do things as a family. That's correct. And so between the time that you stopped doing anything with the Jensen's and Miss Jensen's funeral, you the only time you had any conversation with, with, I'm sorry, the only time you had any conversation with, with Ms. Jensen was sometime in October of 1998. I think you took a bike trip with your wife. Um, I do remember reading that, oh, but that's correct. I didn't see much of her. Um, I, you might have remembered reading it. I'm asking if you actually remember it, though. Um, I remember it when I read it, but you know what? Prior to reading it, that you was not a part of my memory. So... Sometime in October of 1998, you and your wife were on bikes. That's correct. And you stopped by the Jensen home. Yes. And you saw Julie Jensen. That's correct. And you saw Mark Jensen. That's correct. And after that time, you didn't have any other conversation with Julie Jensen. That's correct. You didn't see Julie Jensen again I after did not. that. You didn't call her on the phone and say, hey, I hear you're a little down. I did not. I never talked to her by myself. You did know, because Mr. Jensen shared it with you, that Julie Jensen had this affair. Yes. Sometime in 1990, 1991. That's correct. And that she had filed for divorce. Yes. And at that time, David Jensen was a small child. Yes. During the course of this friendship with Mr. Jensen, he did talk to you about concerns about the harassment of his wife and himself. Um, I, I couldn't hear all of that. During the years that you were friends and co-workers with Mr. Jensen, he did talk to you about the harassment of himself and Julie Jensen. Yes, he did. He did talk to you about phone calls from made to the Jensen home. That's correct. He also talked to you about photographs left at the Jensen home. And on his work vehicles, that's correct. So he told you about the 
photograph on his work vehicle. That's correct. And you said that this was a small office. Uh, the Prudential Beige office was huge, and I believe there were pictures left. We had 80 brokers. There were pictures left at that time, I believe. But the, uh, the Baird office obviously was small, and I didn't work there. The Stiefel office was very small, and I did work there. So the Baird office that he was at, you were not at? That's correct. So, sorry. Although he had told you about it, you weren't there when he found them. That's right. Mr. Nearing, you've been a stockbroker for a long time before you retired? Yes. It'd be fair to say that companies have specific symbols that they use, um, like McDonald's is MCD? Yes. And Citicorp is CCI? I think it's just C, or it was nine years ago. It might have changed now? Uh, you never know. HD is Home Depot? Correct. WMT is Walmart? Yes. DE is Deer & Company? Nothing runs like a deer. Right. That's what my stepdad says. Uh, PDE is P Pride Petroleum? Yes. And those are symbols that stockbrokers use when talking about companies. Yeah, the prices show up on the tape that you see, the scroll. And when we want to look up information on our work computers, we use those symbols. So if I put in Google, um, S, uh, let's say GLM, it's going to come up with Global Marine. Maybe not glo Google per se, but if it's a financial site, it would. It might show me that there is something associated with that. I'd have to click on it to get what it was associated with. Yep. And those are BBY is Best Buy. Correct. And those are pretty common um, symbols that stockbrokers know. Yes. Is there a Security Industry Association for stockbrokers? Yes. And they sometimes have dinners or meetings? Uh, I don't know what organization you're talking about in particular, but uh, our company had dinners. I don't know if that's what you're referring to. I did not know that, but um, your company well, had Well, like the blueprint um, you referenced. So that would be some type of a meeting that would be had. That's correct. You testified on, when I was asking you some questions about schedules, that Mr. Jensen was kind of a later morning, later at night kind of worker. You were an early morning, leave at a normal time worker. That's correct. And that was pretty consistent over the years. Yes. It'd be fair to say you weren't checking him in and checking him out? Uh, we all worked whenever we wanted to. That's correct. If he was going to be late, he might call or he might not? He would not call. He would not call. You testified on direct that Mr. Jensen did not come into the office on December 2nd. Is it that you just didn't see him? I just want to clarify. You didn't see him or he didn't come in? Excuse me. Um, Sorry, December 3rd is what I meant. Uh, Thank you. you had me confused there. I That's was confused correct. too, sir. Um, that I didn't see him or he didn't come in. Are you asking if there's a difference there? Yes. Um, I, I don't think he ever came in where I didn't see him. So. Yeah, maybe he came in and I didn't see him, but his office is right by mine, and that wasn't the type of relationship we had in the, in the office. So it's possible he would have come in and you wouldn't have seen him. You might have been in a meeting. It's not possible. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. You might have been on the phone. Uh, okay. I'm just asking, sir. Is it possible that you could have been on the phone at some point during the day? And I and therefore, I wouldn't have known that he arrived? Correct. That's not possible. You did um, tell, talk to Detective Ratzberger well, about whether Mr. Jensen came in on December 3rd. Okay. Do you remember that? We talked about so many things. No, I don't remember speaking with him specifically about it. Do you remember telling him that Mr. Jensen did call you and talk to you about whether he would be in? On December 3rd? Yes. I do not recall that. Do you remember telling him that Mark Jensen told you he would be in late or not at all? I do not recall telling him that. It'd also be fair to say that some stockbroker business happens outside of the office. Yes, we see people outside of the office. That's correct. You meet clients. Right. Go out for lunch. 
Right. Go out for dinners. Yes. Business is done at those points. Yes. You said you spoke to Mr. Jensen on December 4th? The day after, that's correct. Um, and that's when he called to tell you that his wife had passed away? That's correct. And he told you he thought it was a drug interaction? Um, as I sit here, I don't remember what he told me, but he did tell me that she had passed, and I was blown away. He told you that, he had, that she had recently seen a doctor for depression? Yes. And been prescribed medication? Yes. You were asked a couple questions about Ed Klug, another stockbroker at Stiffel Nicholas. Okay. You weren't friends with Mr. Klug at the time that you were working at Stiffel Nicholas. What, was I friends you with did him? In 1998. I should be more clear about the timing, sir. No, I, I, I don't think I knew him before they opened the Appleton office. And at some point... Mr. Jensen was charged with the crime in this case. With the what? With first degree intentional homicide. You know he was arrested and charged. That's correct. And at some point, you actually went and searched for Mr. Klug at a conference. Uh, that's correct. Oh, correct. And you were searching for Mr. Klug because you had heard rumors about what he had said. Mark Jensen told him. That's correct. And. This was a conference um, that you both had attended. Yes. And that was in 2006. Uh, yes. And he told you that at this Blueprint conference, they had both been drinking. Yes. And that's when they had this conversation that Mr. Klug says Mr. Jensen admitted that said something about killing his wife. That's correct. Do you remember testifying in 2007 that the conversation between Ed Klug and Mark Jensen, Ed Klug said it happened when opening the Appleton office? Yeah, when I read the transcript review and I read that, I said I thought Ed Klug had told Mark in Appleton. Um, That wasn't the way I remember it today. I remember Ed telling me that Mark told him that in St. Louis. So there's a discrepancy there. But so anyway. in 2006, you spoke to Mr. Klug, right? Um, yes. At this conference. Yes. About this conversation between him and Mr. Jensen. That's correct. And a year later, you testified at a hearing. Yes. And during that testimony, you said that the conversation happened when they were both in Appleton. That's correct. During the conversation, he also told you that other people were present when Ed Klug and Mark Jensen were speaking. Excuse me, counsel, what page on the transcript I'm here? I'm cross-examining. I'm not on a transcript. Well, you can't have a personal conversation between the lawyers here. I do have some job here. <laughs> I'm not quoting from a transcript, Judge. All right. Thank you. Ask a question. Um, Once again, please. Oh, yes. I have to remember what the question was. During the conversation that Ed Klug had with Mark Jensen that he then told you about, Ed Klug said there were other people present. Okay. That's correct. Now, 2006 wasn't the only time you talked to Ed Klug about this case. Yeah, when I, again, when I read the transcript, I couldn't believe how many times I saw Ed Klug. You actually uh, talked to him a lot after it, 2006. It appears that way, and I don't remember those conversations, but it, it appears that I did. Um, you, you talked to him after you testified in 2007. Most likely. In fact, until I read the transcripts and... I had completely forgotten about the uh, airplane trip from Boston with Ed Klug completely. It wasn't, that was just gone from my mind. So, um, yeah, I talked to Ed a number of times. And you talked to him after his testimony in 2007? Probably, yes. A 
a few more questions, sir. I want to talk to you a little bit about the conversations you had with Mark Jensen in November of 1998, if you remember them. Okay? Okay. Um, as a result of the conversation you had with Mr. Jensen, you asked your wife to go out to dinner with Ju or lunch with Julie Jensen. That's correct. And she did that? Yes, she did. The conversation you had with Mr. Jensen is that Julie Jensen was crying regularly. Yes. And that she was withdrawn. That she was withdrawn, yes. And he was concerned about that. That's correct. That she was locking herself in her room. Yes. That she was losing weight. Yes. And that she was miserable. Yes. He told you he wanted her to see a doctor. Yes, he did. She did not want to see a doctor. That's correct. He told you he was encouraging her to go to the doctor. I think I testified last time that he said the only way he could get her to a doctor, and these are his words, was that if he duct taped her up and uh, threw her in the car. So yeah, he wanted her to go. He and said he wanted her to go. And she didn't want to go. Objection calls for speculation as to what she did or did not want to do. Sustained. Judge, it was only based upon his answer. He said move on. He told you that Julie was afraid of ending up like her mother. Yes. And you knew her mother had some medical issues? Yeah, I believe it was alcoholism. And she and Julie feared being hospitalized like I don't know her if mother. She did, but that's what Mark said. That's what Mark told you. That's correct. And that was in November of 1998. Sounds right. He also talked to you about her previous treatment for depression. Um, perhaps. You don't specifically remember? I don't. So you talked a little bit about this computer that Mr. Jensen said he tried to fry with a large magnet. Yes. You know that you can't fry a computer with a large magnet, correct? Um, I didn't say it. He said it. I, I don't know if you can or you can't. I've never tried it. Okay. You also testified that Mr. Jensen was kind of the person you went to if you had issues with the computer software. Yeah, not so much issues, but just in helping to, to use the various features. And that was the software that was on the computer for your work? No, it was a software that was on his personal computer. Okay. Did it you was work-oriented. It was work-oriented? Yes. And did you use that software? Yeah, I had a laptop and used it as well. It wasn't about, like, if your computer died, he would come in and fix it? No, no, it. no, no, no. It was just about utilizing the software. He wasn't the IT tech of Stiffel Nicholas? No, he was not. Nothing further. Thank you, sir. Uh, Thank redirect, you. Mr. Jamboys. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, on cross, defense counsel was asking you about Mark's conversations with you about Julie, uh, suggesting that he was actually communicating real observations about Julie. But really, at the end of the day, was it your impression after Julie's death that he was conveying this information to tell you about Julie, or was he conveying this information to you for some other reason? Objection, relevance. Overall, go ahead and answer the question. Go ahead. Yeah, I was always uh, doubtful of the things he was saying. And um, what what was it, what was you, did you have a suspicion or an inference that you drew as to why he was telling you these things? Objection, speculation. Overall, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Once more on the question. So did you draw an inference or ha uh, develop a suspicion as to why Mark Jensen was telling you these things, what his motive was? Well, I knew what was going on in the background, and it, it, it felt very strongly like he was uh, uh, trying to lay a, a path or an alibi in my lap. Um, so yeah, I never really bought into all of the things he was saying. And, 
And you even had your wife check on Julie to see if there was truth to what he was telling you. I did. That's part of the reason. That's correct. Now, defense counsel had asked you some questions about your previous testimony, and I'm going to go into that. First of all, um, You were, you were uh, sent the transcripts of your testimony from the, from your testimony on August 29th, 2007. You were sent that testimony? I believe so. And it was 87 pages long about? Does that sound about right, 88 pages yeah, long? Yeah, there was an 88 page one. Yeah. And then the first day of your testimony on January 9th, 2008 at the later hearing and um, that was from pages 252 to about 270. Please speak into the mic. It, with uh, this I'm plastic, sorry. it's hard to hear you. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, so then the first day of your testimony at the later hearing, um, it was from pages 252 to page 270. Is that about, sound about right? Yes. And then from the next day of your testimony, it was from page 1 through Page 126, does that sound about right? Yes. So you didn't commit your, to memory all of those, all of your testimony from all of those proceedings, did you? I couldn't, and in fairness, even as I read it and tried to refresh my memory, there were just so many dates and so many things. Um, I couldn't refresh my memory on everything. It's just it's so much, and it was so long ago. But one thing that's similar to all those proceedings and this proceeding is you're not just sitting up here and just telling the jury whatever comes to mind, you're actually asked questions by lawyers, correct? Yes. And if the lawyer doesn't ask you the question, then you won't provide that answer, correct? Um, I don't think they'd let me, but that's correct. Now, defense counsel had asked you about questions at uh, page 117, so counsel, I'm directing the court and counsel's attention. This is the transcript of day six of that previous hearing. And I'm gonna to go to page 117. And defense counsel had posed you some questions, and they were found uh, directing court and counsel's attention to, uh, well, it, these lines aren't marked, but uh, it's about the middle of the page. Question, do you recall being asked the following questions and providing the following answers? Question, and Mr. Albee asked you questions about audits that the home office could do and about system checks that the home office could do on your computers, correct? Answer, yes. Do you recall being provided that question and giving that answer, or now would you concede that, that was a question and answer that was posed? You gotta run that by me again, please. Okay, that was the question and that was the answer that was provided to you at the time? Yes. And then the next question, question, did that ever happen to your knowledge in your office? Answer, you mean a system check on computers? Question, mm-hmm. Answer, a system check by the home office? Question, yes. Answer, they routinely monitor various things. Do you provide, do you recall being posed those questions and giving those answers? Or do you at least concede that those questions were posed and those answers provided? Yes. Now, and those questions were just posed to you by defense counsel on uh, your cross-examination. So now, to put that in context, do you recall then being asked the, uh, the next question? And this is the bottom of page 117. As of this conversation that you had with Mr. Jensen, where suddenly the next Monday his computer was fried, at that point, were you aware of any system checks where internet history would be checked? Answer, no, not specifically. Um, do you recall being posed that question and giving that answer, or concede that that question was posed and that was the answer that you gave? I concede.
Um, on cross, defense counsel had asked about whether or not you'd ever told anybody about or the conversation where Mark Jensen was asking you about the suitability of Ms. Labonte coming to stay at the house. Do you recall her asking you those questions? I do. And um, so directing your attention now to page 93 of your testimony on January 10th, 2008. Do you recall being asked the following question and giving the following answer? Page Nine, I'm sorry, page 93. Closer, closer to the mic, please, Bob. Page 93. Um, do you recall being asked the following question? I'm actually, it, was, yeah, it might be page 94. Let's see what, what page. No. It's, yeah, it is page 93. Um, Do you recall being asked the following question and providing the answer, following answer? Question, do you recall him discussing the suitability of Ms. Labonte coming to stay at his house? Answer, that's correct. Question, this is the same house he shared with Mrs. Jensen? Answer, yes. Question, and what did he ask about? He asked, answer, he asked if I thought it would be, seem out of place if he presented her to the family as a friend or an acquaintance from the home office in St. Louis. Question, and what did you, Tell him, answer, I thought it would be out of place. Now, um, do you recall being posed those questions or, or do you acknowledge that being posed those questions and providing those answers um, on January 10th, 2008 at the earlier hearing? Yes, or I concede that I probably did. Thank you, Mr. Nearing. I don't want to uh, recross on those limited questions. Briefly. All right. Um, you were just asked that last question about Ms. Labonte staying. That was in relation to the wake, correct? In relation to what? The wake. About him introducing her as a colleague from Stiffel Nicholas. No, I think he said wake. moving into the, excuse me, moving into the home as well. And I put so, the two mm -hmm. conversations together. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you there, sir. Go ahead with the question. You were asked a question, same place, um, just slightly before what Attorney Jamboyce read. Do you recall a conversation you had with Mr. Jensen regarding the suitability of Ms. Labonte coming to Ms. Jensen's wake? Your answer was yes. I do. And it was shortly after that that you were asked the question, do you recall him discussing the suitability of Ms. Labonte staying, coming to stay at his house? That's correct. Yes. And then... Two questions later, and what did he ask about that? Answer, he asked if I thought it would seem out of place if he presented her to the family as a friend or an acquaintance from the home office in St. Louis. That was your answer. Okay, yes. And that was in relation to the wake. That's correct. Nothing further. Thank you, sir. All right, your excuse. Thank you. Yes, I did not have any re re redirect, Your Honor. <laughs> you can go. You got to talk to them, okay? The prosecutor? Yeah. Let's see, we call Sharon Nearing to the stand. What number is that? Number 53, Your Honor. Thank you. Judge, I'd move exhibit 16 in. Judge, I'd move exhibit 16 into the record. Uh, 16's moved in.
They have a flag over there. I'm all the way up front here. It remains oh, stand. Yeah. It's the way it is. You can raise your right hand. Oh. So I swear the testimony is meant to be the truth, whole truth, not but the truth's help you, God? Yes. Thank you. Have a seat. Get as close as you can to the little microphones. Spell your first and last name for the reporter. Sharon Nearing. Spell your first and last name for the reporter. S-H-A-R-O-N-N-E-H-R-I-N-G. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Jambo. And Ms. Nearing, you're married to David Nearing? Yes. And how long have you and he been married? 46 years. Um, do you recall a time where... Um, your husband and you became friends with the Mar Mark Jensen and his family? Yes. And when would that have been, if you, if you can recall? I would say, do you have a date for Douglas's birth? I do not. Oh, okay. He, he was probably one or two years old because the things that we did outside of that, he had been sitting up. So, I mean, I can give you a better time frame if you can tell me when he was born because I, that's kind of where my my recollections are he was at least that old. Do you recall providing a statement, a signed statement, um, on August 28, 2002 to Detective Ratzberg? Yes. And if at that time you said myself and my husband, David Nearing, became friends with the Jensen's in about 90 or 91, does that refresh your recollection as to how long and how, when you and your husband became friends with the Jensen's? It refreshes my recollection um, as I was thinking about it. Again, it's been a long time. My recollections of knowing them, again, it's old, but I believe we knew them more when, um, like I said, Douglas was of an age that he could sit up, so that, that would be the time frame that I could work from. I'm guessing more closer to we might have started doing things mid-90s rather than right when, when they met, um, when they first started working together. So you and Mr. Nearing had children? One, yes. And the Jensen's had two children? Correct. And it was about that time when Douglas was old enough to sit up on his own that you and, you and the, your family started doing things together? Correct. What sort of things did you and your uh, did your families do together, if you can recall? Um, we had been to their house for dinner. They had been to our house. Uh, we went biking up in Door County, and we went cross country skiing in Door County. So it sounded like a pretty active uh, family type activities that you did together. Yeah, always family. Yes. And did you have an opportunity to see how Julie was as a mother, and how she was as a person? Yes. So what was your impression of Julie as a mother and as a person during the, as you got to know her and Mark Jensen? My impression was that she was enjoying and loving being a mother. Now, do you recall in October of 1998, you and your husband um, riding your bicycles from Racine to um, Pleasant Prairie to see the Jensen's? Again, very long time ago, but vaguely. Uh, did you place the date of that in your in your calendar? Uh, um, possibly, but I, I don't have that date available. At the time that you gave this statement um, to Detective Ratzberg on August 28, 2002, were these matters fresher in your mind? I would assume so. So... If you wrote, if you, in your statement, indicates on October 10th, 1998, myself and my husband biked down to see the Jensen's in Pleasant Prairie. We didn't call them ahead of time to see who was home. I remember that date because I wrote it down in my calendar, which I still have. Judge, I object. Does I don't that, think this is refreshing. Does that refresh your recollection? witness to look at the statement? Yes, I would, Judge. Do well, we have the statement, Mr. Jambo? I've got it here on my computer. <laughs> I didn't print it out. That's why I was doing it this way. Let's put it this way. Instead of I using it. The defense counsel's given you a copy of this oh, statement. Thank you. Thank you. I will, um, this has been marked as an exhibit, but I will show you this document. Yes, you read it yourself. Don't read it out loud, just read it yourself.
Okay, if I gave you that date, I, I do keep calendars, and I do write, like, I don't want to call them logs, but I write notes of what we do, and I've done that forever. So if that's the date I gave you, I'm fairly sure that it was correct. So um, th we'll then treat this as a recorded recollection rather than as a refreshed recollection. So your recorded recollection was that on October 10th, 1998, Myself and my husband biked down to see the Jensen's in Pleasant Prairie. We didn't call him ahead of time to see he was home. I remember that date because I wrote it down in my calendar, which I still have. Judge. So that, was your, that was your recollection at the time? Correct. Judge, I would object as to leaning. I think if Attorney Jamboys is going to ask her questions and she doesn't remember, she can refresh her recollection with the document that's been provided. She doesn't actually have her notes from back then, which would make it a past recollection recorded. Well, actually, this is a statement that she ask wrote. The, just ask a question, Mr. Jamboys. Okay. Now, um, thinking back to that time that you rode to Pleasant Prairie and you visited with Mark and Julie Jensen, do you recall seeing anything unusual about Julie Jensen at that time? Did she appear to be, or did she appear to be normal Julie Jensen that you'd known your, for a number of years? Again, um, recollections are a little old, um, but I just do remember writing down, I think they were working out in the yard. We said hello, um, probably turned around and went back because it was a fairly long ride. Okay. Now, do you remember sometime in the month of no November 1998, um, your husband, David Nearing, uh, conveying to you uh, information that he'd received from Mark Jensen concerning Julie Jensen's condition? Yes. And what had your husband told you about Julie's condition, that Mark had told him about Julie's condition? That she was feeling poorly, that she didn't want to get out of bed, um, and that she was feeling sick. And did... David, near it, did your husband suggest that you do anything in response to receiving this information? Yes. He what? suggested maybe I call and see how she was doing, and um, I guess we both kind of came to the conclusion that if she was doing fine, I would ask her out to lunch. So did you call Julie Jensen? Yes. And did you end up asking her to go out to lunch? Yes. And do you remember where you went for lunch? I didn't until I reread the testimony, but Culver's. I know we did fast food, but it was Culver's in, um, in Kenosha. And um, so when you went to visit with Julie or meet Julie at the Culver's in Kenosha, uh, did she come alone or did she bring somebody with her? She brought Douglas with her. And did you have your son with you or not? No, he was old enough to be in school. Um, so when you had this lunch with Julie, you, were you, do you recall whether you were looking for the signs that um, Mark Jensen had conveyed to your husband about Julie being depressed and lost weight and gaunt and depressed and things like that? I wasn't doing an examination, but I was there to just talk to her and see how she was. And to assess her condition in comparison or contrast to the way it had been described to your husband by Mark Jensen. Would that be fair? That would be fair. And did you assess Julie's condition in comparison or contrast to the manner in which her condition had been described to your husband by Mark Jensen? She drove herself there. Um, she brought Douglas in. We sat down. We had a conversation. Um, we had a meal. I did not see that she looked sick. I mean, not a doctor. I understand that. Um, but she looked fine to me. In my, in my estimation. I mean, I'm not... Again, I can't make a judgment call because I'm not a doctor. You didn't see any evidence of her being depressed or suicidal? No. Objection. But again, I can't make that. I'm not a doctor. so. Uh, the objection was overruled. Continue, Mr. Jambos. She appeared as the same Julie that I have seen before. Did she say anything to you about her marriage and the state of her marriage? I'm going to basically fall back on reading my testimony because, again, I don't have a lot of, it's been a long time. Um, I do believe she had mentioned, and I don't remember the word, but that she was not happy. She didn't know how things were going, let's put it that way. She wasn't happy about her marriage. I 
I would want to say just more unhappy at the moment. I, I don't, again, I, I would have to reread my testimony, but I would just say not, I would not in the best of moods about how, thing, how things were with her at the moment. Um, well, first of all, I'm going to move that statement into evidence as an exhibit. So what exhibit number one? Is it marked? All right, let's have it marked with the clerk. The last sentence? The last sentence on that exhibit. Actually, the last two sentences. Okay. Based on what I said back then, I'm going, I, I would assume that's what I said. Um, again, it's been 20 some years. So if she mentioned as being unhappy, then I would assume that's what, what she said. So the recorded recollection at that time was, quote, Julie did mention that her marriage wasn't going well and that she wasn't sure what to do next. She didn't know what to do about Mark or her marriage. That was your statement on August 28, 2002, correct? Correct. And on August 28, 2002, you had a clear recollection of that communication or the conversation you had with Julie. Is that true? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Nearing. I don't, I don't have any further questions. Uh, Thank you. Cross. Ms. Nearing, you said that you became friends with the Jensens because your husband worked with Mark. Correct. And although they met each other in 90 or 91, you specifically remember that you became closer after Douglas was born. I've been trying to think this whole thing through, and again, it's been a long time. Um, I don't have recollections. We may have done things socially with them earlier in the 90s, but my clear recollections are when we went biking and we went cross-country skiing, Douglas was old enough to sit up. So I'm, again, depending on when Douglas was born, I'm guessing that's when we maybe did more things more socially. So your memory is that you did things more socially after Douglas was born, although you may have done things previous to that. Again, I do not remember. I've been trying to rack my brain to remember if I remember seeing him as a baby and I I'm sorry it's just not there and when you did things as a family it was like activities or dinner in the home correct and by activities I mean the cross-country skiing in Door County correct biking correct um, did you guys do hiking also uh, those are those are really the only two instances I clearly remember that I have some memories of are the, the biking and the cross-country skiing. And when you guys went to Door County, you would stay in hotels? Correct. Do you remember ever getting babysitters for the children and going to strip clubs? No. Now, you would see Julie when you did these things as a family. Would you consider her a close friend? I guess to me close is someone you call up if if you're down or they're down or whatever. And so I would say maybe not. I would say a social friend um, that I felt comfortable with, um, that, that I knew, that I knew their children, but, but maybe not, I wouldn't consider it close. So you guys would see each other occasionally when you guys were meeting with your families. Correct. Or they were coming to your house for dinner or you were going to their house Correct. for dinner. Correct. Julie didn't talk to you about the affair she had in 1991. I did not know about that, no. She didn't talk to you about her mother's alcoholism or any depression in her family? Um, the mother's problems, I, I don't know where I would have found that out because of the last everything that's happened over the last time. I don't know where I would have known that from. 
So you do know it. You're just not sure where you Correct. got it from. I don't know if it would have been from Julie. I don't remember if it would have been from Julie or not. You've spoken to other people about this case, um, including your husband. Well, yeah, we were on trial last sure. time. Um, and the and you've spoken about like what you remembered and what others have told you dear, to each other. Correct. So it's possible you got that from him. It's possible. It's possible she told me. I, again, I, I don't have a recollection. That's fair. Now, you said that you um, observed the family interact um, when you guys were together hiking and biking. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And you also observed the family. Not my head. Is that what you're telling me? Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is what I'm saying. Um, you also saw the family interact in October of 1998. Yes. Briefly. Very briefly. On this bike ride. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> is that because you were, did you bike down from Milwaukee? No, we live in Racine, so we would have biked from Racine. So you biked from Racine, kind of stopped at the Jensen home. Mm -hmm. I think you testified you saw them outside. I, if my recollection is correct, they were working in the yard. And you didn't see any issues between the two of them? No. Prior to October of 1998, when was the time before that that you had socialized with the Jensens? I don't know. Is there a time that you stopped socializing with the Jensens because of your husband's comments to you about Mark Jensen having an affair? Yes. And that was sometime in the summer of 1998, if you remember. No memory. And during the bike ride, you stayed for a short period of time. Correct. You didn't observe anything unusual? Nothing unusual. Julie Jensen didn't express any fears or concerns to you? No. So I want to go to this Culver's lunch that you and Julie Jensen had. Okay. Was that in Kenosha? Yes. And so you drove to Kenosha to meet her for lunch? Yes. And she had Douglas at the time? Yes. And do you remember how old he was? Two to three years old? That would be my estimation. And just like most three-year-olds, old, three year olds, um, Julie was kind of doting on him? Yes. Making sure that he was eating? Yes. Making sure that he was staying in his seat? Trying. Making sure he wasn't running around Culver's Restaurant? Correct. And during this time, you had an opportunity to talk to her? Yes. Did you ask her if she was depressed? No. Did you ask her if she had been locking herself in her room? No. Did you ask her if she had been refusing um, to come to eat? No. If, can I add? If anything, I would have just asked how she was. And when you asked how she was, she told you she was unhappy. Correct. And during that time, she never expressed any fear of Mr. Jensen. I, I can't say. And you can't say because your memory is not clear about everything that's happened over the last 24 years. Correct. In 1990, in, I'm sorry, not in 1990. In 2002, you <coughs> talked to Detective Bradsburg. Correct. And he wanted to know everything that you knew about Julie Jensen and Mark Jensen. Correct. He knew that you had had lunch with Julie Jensen at Culver's. Yes. Because your husband had told him. Yes. So he wanted to know about that interaction. Yes. And he asked you questions about it. Yes. He asked you what you observed. I'm guessing. He asked you what Julie Jensen said to you. I would assume. And then after that, a statement was written. Okay. And you had a chance to review that statement, Exhibit 23. Yes? Yes. Did you write that or Detective Ratzberg write it? I do not know. It starts off with myself and my husband. Does that refresh your memory as to whether you wrote it or he wrote it? I do not know. 
So it's possible you wrote it or it's possible the Detective Ratsburg wrote it and then you reviewed it. I do not know. What don't you know? I don't know if I wrote it or he wrote it. Okay. But no matter who wrote it, after it was written, you reviewed it. Correct. And you signed it. Correct. And in fact, when you signed it, it says, I have read the above statement and found it to be true and correct. Yes. And there's nothing in this statement about Julie Jensen expressing any fear of her husband. No. I have nothing further. Thank you, ma'am. Exhibit 23 has been received into evidence, is that correct? <clears throat> Exhibit 23 has been received into evidence, is that correct, Your Honor? Yes. Okay. 23 is received. Judge, I think my concern is that we're, we were asked, we asked very specific questions about Exhibit 23, but I'm not sure we asked every single thing that was in there. Well, the I've only got one question. He's got one question. We're going to hold him to it. Okay. So looking at the exhibit, it's clear that this, uh, that this statement was not written by anybody. It was typed, correct? When I've seen it, yes. And it's on a form, statement, and then name, Sharon K. Nearing, so forth, correct? Correct. So unless that at the time you obtained this, Mark Jen, or at the time Paul Rathberg obtained this statement from you, um, were you sitting at a typewriter or a computer, or was Mr. Ratzberg, or do you remember anybody sitting at a computer? No memory. I, I remember talking to him. I don't remember the particulars of what was happening. Um, but it was a typewritten statement, correct? Correct. Yeah. Nothing further. Nothing. Thank you. You were excused, thank you. Thank you. All right, folks, perfect timing. We can take our lunch break. Please be back at 115. Please don't talk about the case. Holding the jury, let's go to lunch. You can take the defendant back. <clears throat>
field spatter. All rise for the jury. Everybody can have a seat. We're back on the record, Mark Jensen, the appearances are the same. The jury's back in the courtroom. Thank you for coming back on time, ladies and gentlemen. Who is the state's next witness? The state calls Rosemary McGinnis, number 44. Thank you. Just remain standing, raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. Okay. Talk to the judge. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, you're swearing me. I'm I'll sorry. Swear. You solemnly swear the testimony is meant to be the truth. Whole truth, nothing but the truth shall help God. Yes. Thank you. Get as close as you can to the little microphone and spell your first and last name for the reporter. My first name is Rosemary, R-O-S-E-M-A-R-Y. Middle name, Elizabeth. E L I Z A B E T H, last name Mac Innes, M A C, capital I N N E S, like Sam. Thank you. Are you going to do the questioning, Ms. McNeil? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Ms. McGinnis, I want you to think back to the summer of 1998. During that time period, did you uh, join the Stiefel Nicholas office in Racine? Yes, in July of 98. And was that a new office that was opening? They had opened it a couple of months prior to my starting there. I thought maybe in June that they opened it up. And you started working there in July? Yes. Of 1998? Of 1998. And do you recall when in July or just July? 22nd. July 22nd. Um, and where had you worked before? I worked at Piper Jaffray, another brokerage firm that was downtown Milwaukee. All right, and so now you're working in the Racine office of Stiefel Nicholas? Yes, I went from Piper Jaffray to Stiefel Nicholas with a broker who moved to that office, and I went with him as his assistant. And who was that broker? Daniel Exner. Now, um, how big was the Stiefel Nicholas office um, at the time that you would have moved there? It was a very small office, about four or five brokers three support staff, sales assistant uh, and uh, cashier. So there were three females and the rest were the brokers, all male. Um, and so these other women, did they have the same position as you did? Um, Meredith Perez was hired as the cashier and receptionist. Meredith Schultz was hired as a sales assistant. So she would work with the brokers. And I was a sales assistant to Daniel Exner. Um, so three women and two Merediths? 
<laughs> now, um, did they go by nicknames? Yes, they did. Meredith Perez, we called Midge, M-I-D-G-E. And Meredith Schultz went by Mary, and I think she spelled it M-E-R-R-I. How long did you end up working at this Stiefel Nicholas office in Racine? Until about March of 2005, and that's when I transferred to the Brookfield office of Stiefel. Now, when you started working there in 1998, was Mark Jensen also working there? Yes, he was a branch manager. And <clears throat> I want you to... I want you to particularly direct your attention um, back to the time period when you were working with Mark Jensen um, in this office. Um, did you ever, during that time period, receive any harassing phone calls? No, not at all. And did Mark Jensen ever complain of any harassing phone calls that he was receiving? I did not hear him complain about any. And. Did you um, and the other women in the office, was it your job to open the mail? Actually, Midge, Meredith Perez, opened the mail. She was in a little area similar to that, so she was kind of caged off. And she would open the mail and receive in checks, hand deliver the whatever they were supposed to go to the brokers, if it was a, a copy of a letter that the client sent, or something on that order, that was Midge, Meredith Perez's job. So the brokers did not open their own mail? Definitely not. Um, did you ever hear of any mail coming in that was pornographic in nature? I did not hear of anything like that. And did you ever hear Mark Jensen complain that he was getting any mail that was pornographic in nature? I did not hear that at all. Now, did you ever hear Mark Jensen complain about any pornographic material being left on his vehicle? No, I did not hear anything like that either. Do you know where he would park his vehicle? He kind of parked his vehicle towards the back of the parking lot, not right up front. I think he was afraid that maybe somebody would hit it or something because most of the people parked closer to the building, and he would park his car further back in the parking lot. Based upon where his office was, would he be able to see the parking lot? I believe he would have been able to. So through whatever window was in his office? Yes. He would sit forward to his computer, but, you know, he could swing around. So I'm sure he wasn't looking out the window at all times. And it was a second floor of a bank building. So there was the drive through there. But because of the area that he parked in towards the southeast corner, I believe he should have been able to see his vehicle. And that's based on also where you knew he parked his vehicle. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Now, um, I want to direct your attention to December 3rd of 1998. Um, was that a memorable day for the office? Yes, it was. Um, and is that because that's the day Julie Jensen died? Yes, it is. Now, on that day, did I'm sorry, Mark... Did you say December 3rd or 4th? I, I just didn't hear you. I thought sorry. I said 3rd. Thank you. Okay. So we're, for, we're third, referring to Yes, December. we're talking about the 3rd. Okay. And so on that day, did Mark Jensen come into work? No. Now, given the size of the office, is that something you would have noticed, whether he was at work that day? There were only two entrances. One was the front entrance, which I sat right across from. So within... 10, 15 feet, he'd have to walk through the glass doors there. That's also the door that the clients came through. Or he could have come up the hallway through the lunch area. And there again, because of the size of the office, he'd have to walk up that um, hallway and into his office. All right, so based upon where you would typically be um, seated during the day, would you have seen him if he came in either of those entrances? Yes. And just generally him being around the office or in his own office, would you have seen him? Correct. <clears throat> now, 
Regarding um, that particular time period of December 3rd, 1998, um, approximately a week later, um, on December 11th of 1998, was the office having a Christmas party? Yes, we were. Um, was that Christmas party still held? Yes, it was. And <clears throat> was there some consideration or thought among um, yourself uh, or other people in the office about canceling the Christmas party? We had all asked Mark if we wanted to cancel it because we were all fine. Something like that happens in your family. The last thing you really want to do is go and celebrate. And um, what was his response to that? He doesn't want to ruin anybody else's time. And so was the Christmas party held? Yes, it was. And did he attend the Christmas party? Yes, he did. And did you make any observations about his demeanor during the Christmas party? He seemed to be enjoying himself, having cocktails, eating food, talking to everyone. And did you observe him um, with anybody else during this Christmas party? One of Meredith Schultz came by herself, and she was actually sitting next to Mark. I was a couple of seats to the left. And... Um, I guess I would say she was flirting with him. He didn't really flirt back, but he didn't tell her to stop it either. In fact, I'd even asked one of the brokers, Dan Exner, if he couldn't go and talk to Mark about it because it was making people feel uncomfortable how that interaction was going. Based upon your observations, um, did you believe that uh, he was showing any signs of mourning at this uh, Christmas party? I didn't really see any myself, no. Now, in, in this office, um, was there a person working there named Dave Nearing? There was a person, yes, he was one of the brokers, David Nearing, yes. Um, and. Did Dave Nearing ever say anything to you about finding a notebook that had drawings in it belonging to Mark Jensen? I don't know if Dave Nearing actually told me or if he told one of the other brokers about it or if we were in a conversation and he brought it Objection, up. Objection, hearsay, Your Honor. So the cross-examination suggested that there was recent fabrication about this point from Mr. Nearing, and so this prior consistent statement would be admissible. Judge, I think we should have a... What's that? I think we should have a sidebar. Guess what? You get an early break, folks. Thank you. All right, the jury is outside the court. Ms. McNeil, give me your reasoning again why you should be allowed to get into this. So when Dave Nearing testified about having found this notebook, um, he was cross-examined based on having not stated that before in a written statement to Ratzberg in his prior testimony. And so a prior consistent statement is admissible if it is um, to rebut the recent fabrication. So the implication of cross-examination is you're just coming up with this, and this witness can say, no, Dave Nearing talked about it years ago. All right, go ahead. Who's going to argue? I will, Judge, just because Attorney Jamboyce told me about this notebook this morning. It's the first time the defense had ever received any discovery about some notebook that was recovered from Mr. Jensen's office sometime in 1990 to 1991. Um, there was no specific questions to Mr. Nearing about whether he told Ms. McGinnis, and she just testified she wasn't sure if he was the one that told her or somebody else did. So there's potentially two layers of hearsay there. That's my second concern. Third, we were never notified that this witness had mentioned this at all. In fact, she testified previously and gave a statement to the detective, and it's in none of those places. So if there's specific notes that she gave a statement to someone before today that Mr. Nearing told her that, the defense has a right to that discovery. Well, what I did during the lunch hour, um, 
I reread State versus Jensen, 331 Wisconsin, second, 440. That was the uh, Court of Appeals decision. That was. Decided December 29, 2010. I'm not going to get into the issue of confrontation and the letter and all that other issues that were decided later by the Supreme Court of Wisconsin and the United States Supreme Court. But this case that I just cited talked about the penis issue pretty extensively. And I'm shocked how many times they mentioned the word penis. And what did this case say? Now, this is guidance for me. And I, and I like it because it makes my rulings a little easier. So what, what does it say about this evidence that we are trying to keep out? It's admissible as part of the panorama of evidence surrounding the offense. And it talks about numerous witnesses. It talks about the state's theory that before Mr. Jensen... This is the Court of Appeals talking, not me. Before Jensen murdered his wife, Jensen engaged in a campaign of emotional torture by repeatedly confronting Julie with pornographic photos. The evidence involved the relationship between the principal actors, Jensen and Julie, and traveled directly to the state's theory as to why Jensen murdered Julie. Then it goes on to say, it also goes to the issue of the computer because there's an issue of pornography on a computer and that Mr. Jensen regularly surfed the computer regarding the issue of pornography. So the computer is also an issue in this case. And then it also, you know, we're going to have other witnesses that are going to testify. The state talked about Kelly Jensen, and I believe her last name is different now. But it also talks about Kelly Jensen's testimony. Um, and it goes on to say it tended to show that Jensen had a long-standing fascination or obsession with penises. Given this, was likely the one responsible for the penis-focused photos stored on the home and office computer and left around the Jensen home to emotionally torture Julie. Each category of evidence Jensen complains upon was properly admitted. So... It's coming in. Judge, I'm not arguing as to relevance. It's coming in. No, I get that. You, you argued this morning that it was relevant, so don't tell me now it's not relevant. This time I'm not arguing I'll get the relevancy. transcript. No, I'm not arguing relevancy. You yes. argued that this morning, I so did. we're done. Bring Judge, the jury back. I'm arguing hearsay. You but argued is, a different objection this morning, and now you're saying I didn't say that. No, I'm saying, Judge, I agree with you as to this morning. I'm not you can't have every argument you want and get the last word in. Judge, I'm not arguing as to relevancy from Ms. McGinnis. I'm arguing that it's hearsay. She just testified that she wasn't sure if she heard it from Mr. Nearing or heard it from someone else. That's hearsay. And I don't have a right to confront that individual who may have said that to her because she... That, that person hasn't been called. That's the objection. I didn't object as to relevancy. Are you done? Yes. Okay. Bring in the jury, and we'll let the state ask their question on the issue of uh, what was your statement again before I, got, I lost my train of thought here? Um, so what I was asking is whether, um, whether Ms. McGinnis had heard from Dave Nearing before about this notebook. We'll be, that, that question was, will that be allowed. Thank you. I don't know where the bailiffs are. They went, they went to get the jury, Your Honor.
guys for the jury. All right, have a seat. We're going to continue. Um, the uh, objection was overruled. You can go and ask the questions. So did um, Dave Naring ever tell you anything about finding a notebook um, with uh, penis drawings in it? I'm going to repeat what I said. It probably was when we were in a group. I didn't have a relationship with Dave Naring that would have him come and talk to me about penises. So I believe it was, we're standing in the office, talking about this stuff, kind of confused at why somebody would even leave it out. All right, and um, you've described the context for us now, so what did uh, Mr. Naring say about what he had found? Uh, he had actually, I know he had found one when Mark worked at a prior firm and that's the one that I remember Dave talking about. And it was like notepads that people would have with their name on the top. And there were drawings of different sizes and shapes and kind of page after page after page. And um, this conversation you were involved in, was that years ago? Yes, it was. And do you have an estimation of how long ago it was? when I worked down in the Racine branch, so somewhere between 98 and 2005. Now, um, when you were working at that Racine branch, that's the time period when Mark Jensen was arrested for this, correct? I was actually, he, yes, he was arrested in 2002 or 2003. Yeah, so do you recall that time period? Yes. And shortly thereafter, um, did a detective come to the Racine branch? Yes, they did. And uh, did that detective take various things um, for evidence from the Racine branch? Yes, I. He did? Yes. Um, I have nothing further. Thank you. Uh, Cross-examination. Thank you. Oh. So, Ms. McInnes. Oh. Did I say your name right? Yes. Okay. I just didn't know where you were. Oh, sorry, I'm hiding over here in the corner. because oh, I saw her talking before. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so I understand you joined the Stiffel group in July of 1998. Correct. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, you were with, I think Piper, you said Piper Jaffrey? Piper Jaffrey, yes. Okay. Now, you never actually worked at Baird with Mr. No, Jensen. I did not work at Baird. Never worked at Baird at all? At all. So you didn't meet Mr. Jensen until July 22nd of 1998. Correct. And I understand you, you and Mr. Jensen weren't friends outside of work. No. You didn't hang out socially? Well, I live in Brookfield, and they're down there, so in Racine or Kenosha area. No, I did not hang out with Mark Jensen. You didn't have personal conversations with him? No. First of all, I'd only been there... I started in July, so I don't know if people really go into personal things like the first few months that you're there. You're trying to understand what your job duties are, how to work the computers, and so no, I did not have any real personal conversations. So you didn't have conversations with Mr. Jensen about his wife being depressed? No, I never heard that. I know that Julie brought in some food once, well, Julie would make it. Mark would bring in some food once in a while and say, oh, Julie made this. Julie would come in with the two boys, the two sons once in a while. I didn't see that she was depressed when those things were happening. Okay. And what year would that would have been? That would have been, yeah, 1998, 99. Now, 98, I should say, not 99. Now, you had testified about Mark's office at Stiffel. Mm -hmm. You said he had a window in his office? Yes, a big window in the back of him. And he would park in such a way that you would, he would see his vehicle? Not if he's sitting looking at his computer, which, right. which nobody sits and looks at your computer all day long. You talk on the phone, you kind of turn around, 
And at that point, he would have been able to see it, right. not when he's watching his computer. So he parked in a way that he could turn around and see his car. I believe so, yes. All right. And you said that was not where most people parked. No, he parked further back in the southeast corner, and a lot of the other people would park on the like south side. They parked on the west side. There was a parking lot. Okay. Now, you were first spoken to about this case in 2002. That's right? Yes. And that was after Mr. Jensen had been charged in this case? Yes. We heard about it on the phone. One of the clients called up and said something that he had heard that he was arrested. Okay. When you spoke with Detective Ratzberg, so that was about four years after Mm -hmm. Ms. Jensen's death? Yes. So you didn't speak with the police right after Ms. Jensen's death? No. You didn't speak with them after the Christmas party? No. And as far as work attendance, if a broker was not in the office, you didn't like make notes about that, right? No, but if he's calling in, it's going to stick in your mind more. No, because they would go see clients and things like that. But if you're calling up, kind of giving little reports as the day goes on, that's more memorable. And did you speak with Mark Jensen on December 3rd? No, I did not. But Midge, Meredith Perez, was the one that would answer the phone. Okay. Mark would tell her a few things and then transfer him to, like, Dave Nearing or something. Okay. So, on December 3rd, did you find out about Julie Jensen's death? Yes, towards the afternoon. You found out about it that afternoon? Yes. Mark called up and said that she had passed. Okay. And did you take that phone call? No, Midge did. So Midge answered the majority of the calls, fair to say? Yes, she did. Yes, she was the receptionist and cashier. And Midge, again, was the one who opened the mail? Correct. That wasn't your duty. If she wasn't there, if the other Mary wasn't there, then obviously somebody has to do it. It would be my responsibility, one of the three of us. But Midge was first in line, Meredith, Mary was second in line, and I was third. So on December 3rd, did you go to lunch? Yes, I did. Where did you go? I don't even remember where I went to lunch yesterday, but to me, lunch isn't as important as somebody passing away. So it's not memorable enough to care about. Right, but you may have left the office during the lunch hour? Yes, I would have, but the other two ladies were there then. Okay. And, and I'm not even sure if I left because a lot of times I didn't go out for lunch. So you have no recollection of that? Nope. And fair to say typically you would go to lunch around 11:30 and 12:30 somewhere in there and you take an hour yeah half hour 45 minutes an hour okay. wasn't and, set in stone okay fair to say people would kind of come and go as time allowed in that office not the ladies the guys yes the brokers yes they could come and go as they pleased they normally told us where they were going so if clients called in that we could figure out how long they'd be gone. Okay. But the ladies kind of had a set schedule. So if Mr. Jensen were to go, be, go talk to a client outside of the office, that would not be strange? Not at all. In fact, you kind of expected the mm -hmm. brokers to do that in your yes. firm. Yes, provide service for their clients, correct. Was Mr. Jensen a person that would cry at the office often? I'm objecting to relevance, crying often at the office. Let's just go ahead. Do you know the answer, ma'am? I've never seen him cry. All right. It stands. Thank you. Let's go. Thank you. Now, you testified today about a Mr. Nearing talking to you about 
sketches, is that correct? Talking to the office, not directly to me, but yes, talking to the office about these sketches, yes. And was that, that was after Mr. Jensen was charged? I, I don't remember if it was before or after. Probably after, yes. And you're aware that, strike that. And you said that it was maybe David, maybe somebody else that, no, it was Dave, because he worked with Mark at Baird. He is the one that saw that notebook or that notepad with all of the sketches on it. I believe your testimony, though, was that it may have been David who told you, but, or it may have been someone else that David told. Is that correct? David didn't tell me directly. I believe he was talking in the office, and we were all there. The office is small enough that you can hear it. We were probably standing around a desk, kind of shocked. <coughs> Was Mr. Nearing one to gossip in the office? Dave liked to talk. <laughs> and actually, Dave liked to talk, and he knew Mark very well. Because so he liked to talk about Mark. Because they used to go out as couples all the time. Okay. So he probably knew more about Mark than any of us. Okay. And you also testified about a Christmas party? Yes. And at this Christmas party, Mr. Jensen was seen with Meredith Schultz? I don't call it seen with. Well, you saw you, him with her, talking with her. Well, yes, it depends on how you say with. He didn't come with her. I don't know if he left with her because I left beforehand. But yes, they were sitting next to each other, engaging in conversation, talking, laughing, yes. And you said that she was flirting with him, but he really didn't flirt back? I don't remember him flirting back, no. Okay. I don't remember him saying, uh, excuse me, but this isn't the proper thing to do. But I don't believe he was flirting back. Nothing further. Uh, redirect. I have no further questions. Right, thank thank you. you. You can leave. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. He calls uh, Kelly Brooks, formerly Kelly Labonte, and that is number 39. 37? 39. 39. Thank you. Just remain standing and then I'm going to swear you in, okay? Take your time. Put up your right hand. Solemnly swear the testimony is made to be the truth. Old truth, not but the truth, so I help you God. I do. Thank you. Get as close as you can to the microphone and spell your first and last name for the reporter, okay? okay. Kelly Jensen, or Brooks, K E L L Y B R O O K S. Thank you. Who's going to do the questioning? Hi. Go ahead, Ms. McDeal. Is your maiden name Labonte? It is. And um, Ms. Brooks, uh, at some point, did you were you married to Mark Jensen? Yes. Um, and uh, do you see Mark Jensen in the courtroom today? Yes. And can you just uh, point to him and describe something that he's wearing? He's over there in a suit and tie. All right. There's only one individual over there in a no. suit and tie. <laughs> 
that's the individual right yes. there? All right, it's been identified, thank you. Um, so, Ms. Brooks, I want you to think back to approximately 1997. Um, during that time period, did you join the firm Stiefel Nicholas? Yes. And do you know when about you started working for that firm? Um, I believe it was in February. So you think February of 97? Yes. And um, where were you working? Like where physically were you? I was in St. Louis at the corporate office. And so um, this firm, Stiefel Nicholas, it is headquartered in St. Louis? Yes. And that is where you were working? Yes. And what was your uh, job position? Um, I was administrative assistant to the uh, retail brokerage president. Okay. To, and yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And so someone um, who worked at the headquarters of the firm? Yeah. And was he like a boss to other brokers at the firm? Yeah. Yeah. All the brokers reported to him. And what was this person's name? Scott McCaig. And so um, during this time period, was um, Stiefel and Nicholas, was it expanding, opening offices? Yes, they were. Uh, we had a new president and CEO of the entire company come in, and he was big on expanding it. And um, given your job um, with Scott McKay, um, did you help with the opening of new offices? I did. And so did you end up coming to Wisconsin several times to open offices? Yes. Now, when do you recall first meeting the defendant, Mark Jensen? Um, I believe I originally met him around April of 98. And do you recall the context, how you met him? Um, he was uh, one of the brokers that was being recruited to um, open an office um, up in the Racine, Wisconsin area. So where were you when you met him? Do you recall? I was in the corporate headquarters. They, they flew him out to St. Louis to meet with people there. And um, Mr. Jensen was involved in a new office being opened, correct? That is correct. And uh, were you one of the people who helped open that office? Yes. Where was that office? It was in Racine. Do you recall when it opened? Um, I want to say a couple months later, May, June, somewhere in there of 98. OK, so we're talking May or June of 1998 when the Racine office opened? Somewhere around there, yes. And so did you actually come to Wisconsin? Yes. And during that time period, did you meet Mark Jensen again? Yes. Um, after that time period, let's say over the summer um, of 1998, did you ever communicate with Mark Jensen in any way? Yes, yes. And how would you communicate with him? Um, there would be phone calls back and forth for various work things. And um, I believe I went out and he opened the office. I think there were three of them that came over then. And then there was another one, maybe two, that came over later. And um, I went out and helped bring those people on as well. Now, over the course of um, this interaction with the defendant, did you learn that he was married? Yes. And did you learn that he had children? Yes. And um, as far as you were aware, he was still living in the same household with his wife and children? Yes. Did you ever meet Julie Jensen before her death? No. So during this time period, the summer of 1998, um, what was your relationship status? I was engaged. And who is the person you were engaged to? Mark Greenman. Mark Greenman, you said? Mark Greenman, yes. Was that a fairly long-term relationship? Yes. We had been seeing each other on and off for several years. And you didn't have any children, though? No. Um, so as you continued communicating with the defendant, um, did uh, you develop a romantic relationship with him? Yes. 
Do you recall um, the first time that you and the defendant had sexual relations of any sort? Um, it would have been, I believe, around September. September of 1998? Yes. And do you recall where? Um, I think St. Louis. Now, leading up to that point, um, had you uh, been flirtatious with him? Yes. Now, I'm going to show you what has been marked as State's Exhibit 21. So looking at that exhibit, can you tell us what it is? It looks like email messages um, between me and Mark. Now, at some point during the course of this case, um, did you learn that uh, police had obtained email messages between yourself and the defendant? I'm sorry, can you start, state the first part? At some point during the course of this case, did you learn that police had obtained email messages between yourself and the defendant? Yes. Um, and so State's Exhibit 21, um, what you're looking at here, would those be the email uh, messages that you learned were, were obtained by the police? Yes. Um, so fair to say it's not every email you ever sent to the defendant during this time period? That is correct. <clears throat> um, so... State's Exhibit 21 is the physical exhibit. Um, I would like to display on the screen State's Exhibit 20, and this would be the file labeled emails. Now, Ms. Brooks, we're obviously talking about something that is quite a long time ago, 1998. Um, and so um, I'm going to ask you some questions about these email messages during that time period. Okay. Now, um, can you see the screen and see whether that matches the exhibit that is in front of you? Um, I can't read it, but it looks similar. So if I zoom in a bit and you look at the top of your exhibit. Yes. And yes. I can see there's some other screens. Oh, okay. All right. Perfect. But for your purposes, you can look at the paper exhibit in okay. front of you. All right. So um, I'm going to go down. Um, do you see how these emails are in a thread? Yes. And so is it actually the oldest email that is at the bottom of the page? Right. The right. oldest is at the bottom? So uh, when we're talking about the thread, mm -hmm. The yes. one that is the older is at the bottom, and then you work your way up right. to get to the replies and, right. and so forth. Okay. All right. So now looking um, <clears throat> at uh, the first page of the exhibit in front of you, mm -hmm. do you see an email between yourself and the defendant from September 3rd of 1998 at uh, the time on your email says 658 a.m.? Yes. See that? Now, typically, would you be emailing so early? No. Um, so do you believe that this time period is not correct? That is correct, yes. It would be wrong. All right. And so this email that we're looking at um, from you to the defendant, it says, thanks again for yesterday. What a wonderful idea you had and a wonderful time we had. Do you have any idea what you were referring to? Not specifically, no. Okay. So would this refer to a time when the defendant was in St. Louis with you? Yes. And then the well, uh, yeah yeah yes. Do you recall anything else about that now that you've looked at it? No. All right. So now the following line begins with the letter letters I D L Y. Oh right. Mm -hmm. What do those letters stand for? I do love you. All right. So then that line would be I do love you even more now, but no surprise, you are too wonderful for words. Yes. And then XO, talk to you soon, correct? Yes. What does XO stand for? Hug and kiss. 
So by this time, um, you are at least talking flirtatiously with him? Correct, with yes. And you make some reference to having seen him? Yes. All right. Now, just moving up the page, do we see his reply to you um, Thursday, September 3rd, 1998, 10.04 a.m.? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. And so in that reply, he says, thank you. Wish I hadn't been so tired, so little sleep the previous nights. Was great just hanging out. Definitely lucky. Got a few looks and question about being in St. Louis. Cute. All covered. Then Ron called. It was all about Columbus. Just funny the way it flowed. Hey, came in this morning and my blinds were up and I do like those knobs. IDLY, cheers. Is that accurate? Yes. So he uses the same phrase with you, I do love you? Yes. And then moving up to the next email, this is your reply to him. And again, so your reply says 8.09 a.m., but that time doesn't make sense with his 10.04 a.m. email, right. correct? Right, right. And so do you believe your replies were earlier than when you were actually replying? I think the timestamp states earlier. The timestamp yeah. earlier? Yeah, mm-hmm. All right. And then going up to the top, if we look at this email from the defendant to you, this is 2.44 p.m. the same day. Um, what does he say there in that email? Wouldn't mind knobs on my blinds, would prefer cheeks on my desk. Cheers, did you smile? So he's flirting with you? Yes. And then at the very top, your reply, um, what do you say in your reply? If you continue to be a good boy, maybe you'll get what you wish for. I would enjoy participating. Yes, I smiled. I always smile when talking with you. Okay, so you're receptive to the flirting. Yes. All right, so moving on to the, the next page of the document that you have in front of you. And again, to get to the beginning of the email chain, we have to actually go pretty far down. So if you look at your exhibit at page three at the bottom, For this particular email chain from September 4th of 1998, it then begins at the bottom of page three, correct? Yes. Okay, and it starts with questions about lunch plans? Right. All right, so now moving up. You see this email in the middle of the, the page from September 4th, 1998, 11.15 a.m.? Yes. Um, the defendant says to you, know what I'd rather eat, and yes. then there's certain symbols? Yes. Okay, what is he saying? He's making a sexual connotation. And that's oral sex? Yes. When you initially um, had your first uh, sexual relations with the defendant, was it oral sex? Yes. And was it uh, one or both of you who performed oral sex? Both. All right, and then moving up through the pages. Sometimes when you were communicating with the defendant, would you complain to each other about uh, your current uh, significant others? Yes. So he would <coughs> complain to you about his wife? Yes. And would you complain to him about your fiance? Yes. And so if you look at the bottom of page two, um, this email from September 4th at 11.34 a.m., um, it reads, yep, 
lover's nuts thing going on here, my own fault, turned it down last night after I came in because I was pissed, she knew it, dutiful thing. Right now, dutiful would do, nah, cheers. And then it continues, thinking about my desk right now, now that's a way to enjoy lunch. Is that accurate? Yes. And so is uh, he complaining about his wife in that? When he calls her dutiful thing? Yes. And then looking now, this would be page two, and this is the email from September 4th at 11.49 a.m. And it reads, got pissed last night because of her attitude in spa. She knew I was when I got out. I sat out on the deck for hours. When I came in finally, I just reversed the don't touch me thing. So is that again another complaint about his wife? Yes. Would he complain to you about sexual issues with his wife? Yes. All right, now at the very top here, your final reply in this chain, uh, what do you say here at the top of page two? Did we miss the window of opportunity? I met with our significant others, not each other. Okay, so at that point, your perception was that the window of opportunity was completely open with the defendant. I'm not sure what I meant there, quite honestly, because um, it says I met with our significant others, not each other. Oh, okay, yes, I see what you're saying now. Yeah, that there was a window of opportunity for us, yes. And maybe you missed it with the people that you were currently with. Yeah. That that's what it sounds like I'm saying, yes. Um, now if you just turn quickly to page four and take a look at that, what that email is. Is this email just essentially about stocks? Yes. Now turning to page five, does that begin another email thread? Yes. And so if we want to get to the beginning of that thread, um, is that at the bottom of page six? Yes. So way off to the side here. This is an email from you, also on September 4th, to the defendant. And you're asking him, what kind of music do you prefer to listen to when being romantic? Is that correct? Yes. And then you and he have a few emails exchanged back and forth on that topic. He replies to you about what music. Yes. And then you tell him, work with me here. Yes. All right. And then he suggests that thing you do or reggae. Yes. Okay. Is that thing you do an actual song? Yes. All right, and so then along that same chain, if you go to um, page five and go to the email from September 4th of 1998 at 4.08 p.m., um, 
skipping past the, be the beginning part of that email, does he say, I'm going to have to go home and try to fix my high maintenance woman? If I stopped and got Titanic on the way home, wonder if I could get her to sit next to me on the couch, low expectations. Is that correct? Yes. And so along the same lines, he's once again complaining about his wife to you? <laughs> yes. All right. And then um, your response above, um, you are such an incredible man, I want one. Yes. Is that correct. And then he responds, thanks, you can have me. Yes. <clears throat> you call him a tease? Yes. He responds, who's teasing? Yes. And then your response is, I could get used to having you around permanently. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And so this is all on September 4th of 98? Yes. Now directing your attention, if you go to page eight, All right, so looking at this email, 9 4 98 3 p.m., you're asking whether Midge gave him the message that you had called, is that correct? Yes. And was Midge a, a secretary there in Racine? Yes, she, yes. Um, so not only were you emailing with the defendant, you would also call him frequently? Yes. And uh, did you have a cell phone at that time? I did. And would you call him on your cell phone? Yes would you call um, on work phones? Yes. So for instance, this would have been a call to his work? Yes. Um, but you wouldn't call him at home, would you? No. Now, at some point, did these calls become expensive? The cell phone calls did, yes. And so did he give you any money for that? He did send me money to pay the bill once or twice. Okay, so now moving down to page nine. This is, um, do you see the very first email in this thread from September 9th of 1998 at one fifty one p.m.? Yes. And then you talk about in this email to the defendant getting a massage tomorrow and then you the next day. Yes. <clears throat> so um, do you believe that there was some kind of meetup with the defendant um, sometime in the area of September 11th of 1998? Yes. <clears throat> now do you recall where that happened? No, but I think it might've been in St. Louis. Okay, so if we look at, if we remember the earliest emails, it sounds like there was some kind of meetup in St. Louis early in September. Yeah, I think that first one was, he came into town for the day and we went to the zoo and just hung out. And then I'm not sure what this one was, maybe a baseball game or something. Do you remember around that time period going to a baseball game with the defendant? Yes. And was it in St. Louis? Yes. All right, and then uh, the defendant in his follow-up email to you, September 9th, 1998, his reply is, you may sleep through the weekend, and then that face again? Mm-hmm, yes. And is, is that the one you testified to related to oral sex? Yes. And then your reply to him, you may be right, you ready for this? Yes. Okay, so again, you're receptive to this? Yes. Okay, so directing your attention to page 10.
All right, looking towards the middle of that page, an email from you to the defendant, September 15th of 1998, 7.05 a.m. And again, when you look at that time, do you think that's too early for you to be on your work email? Yes. So during that time period, did you only access your email from the office? Yes. And do you have any idea how the defendant accessed his email? Um, he would either from work or from home. Okay. So did you have knowledge that he could access his work email from home? I don't know if he could or not. I, I'm not exactly sure. Okay. So you know for you personally, though, you would have been at work to send these emails? Yes. Okay. Now, in this particular email, looking through it, um, are you complaining about your significant other to the defendant? Yes. Okay, so you're talking about trying to go in the hot tub and the man was too tired? Yes. Now, looking above that, Is his reply to you, that's September 15th, 1998, at 9.39 a.m.? Do you see that? Yes. Now, can you read these middle lines here, beginning with the line that begins with drugs, and then ending before the next paragraph. Drugs are still in effect last night, but got some wood, was thinking about someone else, got carried away, banged into the end of things, so to speak. She don't like that, and that was the end of that. Ha, huh. fun. Aside from that, evening was lousy too, hovering, nothing to say. Now, in those lines, um, what is he describing? Um, having sex with his wife. And he indicates he was thinking about someone else? Yes. So that would be you? Yes. Um, and then indicating that uh, she didn't like, she, meaning his wife, did not like what had happened? Correct. And then can you read the last two lines from him? On that same... Yes, just the two below lines. Feeling a lot more stable today, feeling kind of bad about some of the conversation yesterday. Wish I knew how much of the mood was chemicals and how much you. Cheers, idly. Okay, so I do love you. Yes. Now, what are you talking about with him in terms of drugs? I'm not sure. Okay, and so was he on some kind of drugs? Um... Not that I know of. But he does talk about the drugs still in effect last night. Yeah. And you asked him about it? I did. And then he follows that up with those lines about oh, feeling. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. How are you? The drugs wearing off yet? Yeah. Yeah, I guess he was taking something, but I don't remember what it was. So your understanding is these references are to him regarding drugs and being in effect and feeling stable? I believe so, yeah. And then his response has to do with how much of the mood was chemicals and how much you. Yeah. So he appears to be referring to a good mood being either chemicals or you. Right. All right, <clears throat> so that prior email being um, references to his wife, your response, um, you see at the very top there, 9, 1598, 9, 9.46 a.m. You refer to she um, being so damn prudish about it. Mm -hmm. um, so would that be a reference to his wife? Yes. And um, again, did he describe to you ways in which he thought 
um, his wife was prudish towards him? Yes. And did he ever get specific about that? Um, probably no more than what was in that email. And then you close that email with the XO IDLY always? Yes. Now, turning to the next page, page 11. Now this email that you're looking at on page 11, if you peruse that quickly, that's not so much about your relationship with the defendant, correct? That is correct. You're actually forwarding an email from somebody else to you? Yes. And was that person somehow connected to where you're from in Albu Albuquerque? Yes. So now moving on to page 12. And in the, this next email, which is from 92998, you at the very beginning of this email from you to Mark, you make some reference to this um, Albuquerque friend? Yes. Now can you read those first two lines to us? So am I just being an oversensitive chick with regard to Mark's comment last night. Be honest, I can take it in spite of what my friend in Albuquerque thinks. Okay. Um, and so when you're talking about Mark's comment last night, you're actually talking about your fiance, Mark Greeman, right? Yes. Actually, he was my husband by then. Okay. So what, when did you marry Mark Greeman? Um, I believe September 19th of 98. Of 98? Yes. Um, and so during this time period, why did you decide to marry Mark Greeman? It had been an on again, off again thing for so long, and I just, I guess, didn't have the courage to end it before moving forward with it. Was the wedding set? Yeah. And where did you go to get married to him? We went to um, Tahoe um, via San Francisco. <laughs> um, and so it's true that in the midst of this month where you marry Mark Greeman, you are actively having an affair with the defendant? Yes. All right, so now turning to page 13. Now, does this uh, email begin with some jokes that you had sent to the defendant? Yes. So it's one of those joke emails? Yes. All right. And his response to that appears to be, and looking at kind of the middle of the page, Wednesday, September 30th, 1998, 2.05 p.m., his response to the joke email appears to be some type of joke, correct? Yes. Um, and he makes a reference to Boy Scout. Yes. What was he referring to? His penis. So he calls his penis Boy Scout? Yes. And then your response to him, cute not liking him very much right now, are you? Yes. And then he responds to you, yes, I am, no, I'm not, yes, I am, no, I'm not, like you, cheers. Yes. <coughs> yes. So what was he saying with the yes, I am, no, I'm not? Do you, do you know what he was referring to? I think it was like a conversation between him and his penis. He says, yes, I am, and it says, no, I'm not, that kind of thing. Just kind of a back and forth there. And then it says, like you? I don't know. Were you somewhat noncommittal during this time? Yes. Period? Yes, I was. Okay, because we're talking about the time period right after you 
got married and got mm-hmm. back from the honeymoon. Right. Is, right. Yeah. So um, <coughs> if we're, we're trying to picture the timing, it's September 19th of 1998 that you got married? Yes. And you said you went out to Tahoe via California? Mm, yes. And so you would have been gone out of the area of St. Louis for about how long, do you think? It's about eight to ten days. Okay, so maybe by um, sometime for sure before September 30th, you're back in St. Louis. Yes. Did the defendant know that you went to get married? Yes. Okay, did that prevent him from pursuing you? No. No. Um, Now moving to page 15. Now, in terms of the timing of these emails, so you see there's kind of like a big, long email in the middle of the page there. Mm -hmm. And is that from the defendant to you? Yes. And then your response above that? Yes. Um, So the timing of these emails, October 4th of 1998, and then your reply October 5th of 1998, what had happened right before these emails were sent? And I'm referring to early October of 98. The opening of the Appleton office and the, the meeting that we had. Okay, so um, beginning of October 1998, was there a new office opening for Stiefel Nicholas? Yes, it was the Appleton office. And were you involved in going to Appleton to help open? Yes. And was the defendant involved also in opening that office? Yes, he was. So this was a weekend? Yes, over a weekend. So a weekend when you and the defendant would be at a hotel um, with each other and seeing each other in person? Yes. Um, Did that weekend, did you have sexual relations with the defendant? Yes. And so that particular weekend, did it go beyond oral? Yes. Just sexual intercourse? Yes. And so um, if we're seeing emails from after that time period, um, you can see references to that that weekend. Is that accurate? Yes. Like, for instance, um, near the top of the defendant's email, it talks about up in Appleton. Mm Mm-hmm. And he's referring to someone named Ed. Yes. All right, so I'm not going to have you read this whole chunk of text, but just going towards the bottom. If you read the last two lines of the big paragraph, the, the one that starts with, now that I can, do you see that? Yes. Can you read that out loud? Now that I can think and I'm not totally distracted by this cute creature that was there and had this ability to make everything else disappear. And then how does he end this long email? Idly and a true technically technical cheers to you, hoping you're okay with the tech thing. Now, do you recall what he's talking about with the tech thing? Um, I think that was referring to technically having sex. Would you agree that uh, you and the defendant were somewhat distracted with each other during this office opening? Yes. Okay, and then you send him a response. Um, This is October 5th of 1998 at 328 p.m.? you see that? Yes. And um, you're receptive to what he's talking about with the technical thing? Yes. And then you end with IDLY to you too? Yes.
All right, so now I'd like to direct your attention. Um, do you see on page 16 how there's a, a long email string that starts? Yes. All right, so I'd like to direct your attention then to where that string would actually begin. So that would be page 18. Okay. All right, so um, this email string that we're talking about, it's uh, referring to October 7th of 1998, correct? Yes. And then it just starts with good morning from you to the defendant? Yes. Now at the very top of that page 18, um, you talk about having a bad night? Yes. And then his response to that, um, if you look on page 17 at the bottom of that page, mm -hmm. he talks about giving you a call later or a call soon. Yeah. Yes. And so you would call each other throughout the day. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And when you follow up with the ensuing emails, you're talking about your bad night. Um, if you look at that page, page seven, 17, you're talking about drinking, going out drinking. Yes. All right, so now, um, do you see the email that is from October 7th of 1998? That's 2.46 p.m. It's from the defendant to you, and it starts with must be slipping? Yes. Okay, and then he refers to you getting married. See what getting married did to you? Yes. Okay, and now there's a few different letters that he ends the e email with. We've already talked about the I-D-L-Y, but what's I-W-Y? I want you. Now, um, if you look at how these emails continue going to page 18 and moving towards the top of page 18, is it continuing with the back and forth um, flirtatious emails? On page 18 or 17? So I believe this is page 18. Just want to make sure. Oh, I'm sorry, page 16. Okay, yes. Okay, so you're continuing with the flirtatious emails with him? Yes. Okay. Um, now, early on in this email string, there was some reference to you writing a letter to him? Yeah. Um, did you sometimes write letters to him? Yes. And would you send those letters to his work or to his home? Probably to his work. Do you have any specific memory of this letter from the time period of October 7th of 1998? No. And would he ever write you letters or no? I don't recall, maybe. All right, so now I'd like to direct your attention. There's another email string that begins on page 20. Page 20 where the email string begins. 
And particularly, I want you to look at the one from Thursday, October 8th of 1998, 9.46 a.m., um, okay. from the defendant to you. Mm -hmm. Now, in this email, do you see, um, he first of all asks you, so are you a rollerball or a pen kind of person? Do you see yes. that? And then he asks you, what is your favorite color, fleece? Yes. And then he talks about fishing trips, uh, Missouri, and fly fishing in Colorado. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and was he a person who went fishing or did fishing? Yes. Um, and fly fishing? Yes. Would he travel to do that? Um, I believe so. I believe he had. All right, and then your response to that, you talk about, you're responding to the color of fleece and you talk about a deep green, is that correct? Yes. And then a, apparently um, he talked about some interest in learning how to fly a plane. Yes. Recall that from the prior email? Yeah. And that would um, help get to fishing spots? Yes. All right, so now we are on page 19, the very bottom of page 19. And once again, this is an email from the defendant to you, October 8th of 1998, 10.44 a.m. Do you see the defendant making a reference to driving 10 hours to Big Cedar? Yes. What is he talking about? <clears throat> Big Cedar Lodge in Missouri. It's... Um, it's a lodge on a, on a lake. And so essentially in this email, he's talking about flying would be so much faster. Yes. And then he ends with, I really want you, correct? Yes. I do love you. Is that accurate? Yes. All right, now following up on this email string, um, do you see the email above that from you to the defendant? Yes. October 8th, 1998 at 8.51 a.m.? Yes. And so now, if we go back to the time issue, you see your response is at 8.51 a.m. and his email was from 10.44 a.m.? Yes. So the timing is not correct here. Again, yes. All right, now in this email, um, you're talking about someone named Debbie being pregnant again? Yes. Is that correct? And was that someone um, that your husband, or yeah, your husband at this time, who was Debbie to her, to him? Um, that's his ex-wife. Okay, and so uh, is this something that was concerning to you that his ex was pregnant again? Mm. Probably just that my current husband made a deal, made something out of it. And then the email above that from the defendant to you. October 8th, 1998, 12, 12 p.m. And is this the defendant essentially responding to your complaints about uh, your husband? Yes. And he calls himself, if we go to the, the very first line of his response, mm -hmm. at the end he says, I'm the Boy Scout. Yeah. Now, you see um, in this email he uses the word funky. Was that a word that he would use, a word that you would use? I think we both used it. Um, so it wouldn't have been weird for you to use it? I think I used it because he used it. I think he, he introduced the word and then we used it as a term that we both understood what it meant. Okay. Just the weirdness of a situation. So you kind of adopted it because he used it? I think so. All right, so now Another email thread, do you see the, the next email thread beginning on page 21?
And so if we go to the beginning of that email thread, it's actually page 23, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so you have a pretty short email that you sent to him at the bottom of that page. This is October 8th of 1998, 4.21 p.m. I'm out of here, talk to you later. I do love you, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and then there's a response from him to you. Thursday, October 8th of 1998, the time on his email is 11.17 p.m. Do you see yes. that? Yes. And so in this email, um, he says, just sitting here drinking wine, thinking about this time last week, no issues, just great, missing something. I miss you, a new one. I miss you, I want you, I do love you. Thinking about the last line in your note, feelings the same, if you can't remember, ask. Kind of wondering how to put the crap in the office to bed. There's enough stuff being bounced around that should be able to find out where it actually originates. Suspect it's Mer Mary. She's out tomorrow, so can talk to Rose, Midge, and Barry. If that proves to be the case, she'll have a bad day Monday. This is all tough enough without this stuff. Patience, time, and let it play out. I do love you. Was that accurate? Yes. All right, so he's sending an email where he's referring to sitting here drinking wine. Um, so that's not something he would do at work, correct? Right. Yes, I would not think so. And he's talking about thinking about this time last week. And so this would be an email from October 8th. And so last week would be um, October 1st or 2nd-ish, correct? Yes. Um, and so that's when you were together in Appleton, right? Yes. Now, um, does this email also refer to there being some office gossip? Yes. And is that something you were aware of, that within his office there was gossip about you two? Yes. All right, so then looking at, now we're on the next page, or really the prior page, page 22 in the middle here. Um, is this your response to him? You're responding on October 9th at 6.35 a.m., correct? Yes. And again, you don't think that time is right because you don't think you would have been in work that early? Right. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you to read this whole email, but do you make a reference in it to, uh, do you see the line that says, couldn't you just see me pregnant and sleeping on the couch? What a friendly person I would be for all those months. Not. Yes, I see that. Okay. So are you talking about the possibility of a relationship with him where you had a child? Um, I think my husband at the time and I were talking about getting pregnant. <laughs> And then if we go to his response, October 9th, 1998, 9.36 a.m. Again, I'm not going to ask you to read the whole thing out loud, but um, do you see it's the fourth line down where he references Barry's comment about you being in the knee hole of my desk? Do you see that? Yes. So that's more of the office gossip about you two? Yes. All right. And then again, without having to read the whole email, he appears to respond to your pregnancy comment. Towards the bottom here, he says, pregnant on the couch, pretty picture. Yes. And then he ends with, I miss you last night, and sure, it will be the same tonight, and then obsession. Yes. All 
All right, so the email right above that. This is from Friday, October 9th, 1998, 8.14 8.14 a.m. Um, you talk about learning anything with your charts last, last night. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, and then you have some more complaints about your husband. Is yes. That accurate. All right, and so then if you go to the prior page, this would be the end of this email thread that takes up page 21. Do you see that? Mm, yes. All right, and so uh, is it fair to say that these ending emails here, uh, you continue your uh, flirtatious emailing? Yes. Um, so for instance, the email from you on Friday, October 9th, 1998 at 11.29 a.m., um, you make a reference to 3,000 lashes? Yes. And again, that's part of the flirtation, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and then as part of that, you make a reference in the October 9th, 1998 email, should I come over? Yeah, right. Do you see that? This is from 11.34 a.m.? Yes. Okay. Well, you can't come over because you're in St. Louis, right? That's correct. And he's in Kenosha, Pleasant Prairie. Right. All right. And so when you're on that topic, his email from Friday, October 9th, 1998, 1.57 p.m., he says, time, patience, and figure it out, wait to cool, and I think I could warm you up. Yes. All right. Now, if you look at page 24, the email on that page, is that just like a quick checking in email? Yes. And I know the date's kind of hard to see. Is that October 11th? Yes. 98? Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's then go to page 25. So do you recognize this email from Friday, October 9th, 1998, 8.14 a.m.? Yes. This, this is the same email that we had previously talked about. So did you learn anything with your charts, charts last night, correct? Yes. But he has a new reply above that. Do you see that? <laughs> yes. And this is from October 11th of 1998 at 11.51 p.m.? Yes. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> and so now looking at the very end of this email, it says, okay, 12, time to hit the rack, almost literally sweet dreams. So it appears that his time, 11.51 p.m., that would be accurate because he's making a reference to 12 and time to go to sleep. Yes. All right, so looking at the very next page, that's a quick email from you to him. What time should I return home? Do you see that? Yes. And it appears like this is some kind of email draft, maybe? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it does, compose message. 
All right, so now I want to go to the next string of emails. Um, so if you go to page, go to page 28, does that begin the next string of emails? Yes. Let's, uh, let's take a break. And after three, okay? Your Honor, can we open a window in this? Program? We can open one.
down. We're back on the record. Mark D. Jensen, the appearances are the same. Jury's back in the courtroom. The witness is still under oath. You can continue, Ms. McNeil. So uh, directing your attention to page 28 in front of you, the bottom of that page, the beginning of the this email string, um, do you see that first email from Mark Jensen? And then it's Sunday, October 11th, 1998 at 11, 10 p.m.? Yes. Um, now that email address, the from address, um, do you see it's mjensen at execpc.com? Yes. And then in terms of who it's sent to, there's a Naring D and Exner D, Peterson B, and then Jensen M at Stiefel.com. Um, so Jensen M at Stiefel.com, is that his work email address? Yes. And so the email address above, that's his home or personal email address? Yes. <clears throat> and so this article, October, or this email, October 11th, 1998 at 11, 10 p.m., uh, it references some, uh, some article from thestreet.com? Yes. And so this appears to be a stock-related email and article? Yes. And then he also sends this email to you at your work email address? Right above that? Yes. And then you comment on uh, Dan's email address looking like ex-nerd? Yes. Um, but then you say that you replied back to your home address. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, so that would be the M. Jensen at exec PC? Yes. Now, looking at, um, so we're going from page 28 to page 27. Um, do these emails on page 27 between yourself and the defendant, does that continue the flirtatious emails? Yes. So like, for instance, in the middle, um, October 12th, 1998, 12.51 p.m., he says, all three apply. I miss you. I want you. I do love you. Yes. And so then if we go to the email from the defendant to you on October 12th, 1998 at 1 p.m., um, he's sending you the hugs and kisses signs, right? Yes. And then he refers to that's what I meant about the computer would be nice, but it sucks at the same time being there and not being there. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And is that a, a reference to both of you being physically apart? Yes. Okay, so now I'd like you to go to the next email string, and that begins on page 31. All right, so this email um, from yourself to the defendant um, October 12th, 1998, 11.56 a.m. Uh, subject, Chicago. Oak Brook will move on 10.23 and open for business, 10.26. Okay, so what is that referring to? Uh, it looks like another um, branch that's opening. 
All right, and was that, um, at the time, was that good news for you and the defendant? Yes. Because you'd be able to meet up that weekend? Correct, yes. So the weekend that is upcoming then for the meetup is 1023, and then the Monday is 1026, is that yes. correct? Yes, yes. <coughs> And then his response, he says, right next door, somebody's taking care of us? Yes. So you see it continues, us, ideas, yeah, a lot of ideas. Yes. So then looking at page 30, um, does this continue with the bantering emails back and forth? Yes. Okay, so once again, he's referring to 3,000 lashes, think about it. Yes. And then you reply, you're an evil man, Jensen, to the core. Do you see that? Yes. And then he replies with, <laughs> okay, 6,000. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, and then you talk about what you're going to wear right above that. Yes. All right, so now looking at page 32, this next email string. So the subject of these emails involves Patagonia. Do you see that? Yes. And what is Patagonia? It's a clothing store. All right. So was he offering to buy you something from Patagonia? It looked like he was looking at the stuff and interested in getting something potentially, yes. So, for instance, this, this email chain starts off with him sending an email to you. This is October 12, 1998, 12.57 p.m., he sends an email to you uh, involving the Patagonia online store. Yes. And then your response, do you look at women's clothing all the time or just on occasion? You see that? Yes. Okay, so you, once again, you're joking with him? Yes. All right, and so just looking at the other emails on that page, he's clearly looking at this online store for you? Yes. Um, now the next email string, um, that begins on page 37. So some ex named Tracy was emailing you. Do you see that? Yes. At the beginning of that string? And then were you complaining about it to the defendant? Yes. And so that's how that the topic of this email string started? Yes. All right. So now I want you to look on page 36. All right, so looking at your email in the, in the middle-ish of that page, um, October 12th, 1998, 10.55 a.m., you email the defendant, okay, bored with talking about Psycho Man, on to bigger and better things, how's yours? Okay, 
do you know what you were referring to in that email? It was just a reference to changing the subject and how's yours was a way to say how's your day. There's some sexual innuendo there, but it was kind of a little bit of both. And then right above that, you see his response, my what? Mm -hmm. And then right above that, you respond to him, just testing to see what your answer would be. Nothing in particular, but my mind can go just about anywhere and usually does. Is that accurate? Yes. And then his response to you, October 12th, 1998, 1.15 p.m., wasn't sure if you meant that or my psycho woman. It's lonely and neglected, nothing you can't fix. So is he continuing on with the sexual innuendo? Yes. And then going to page 35, this thread continuing. Do you see in the middle of that page, October 12th, 1998, 1.32 p.m., um, is he talking about a, a sexual encounter with his wife in these emails? Yes. And so it actually starts a little bit below there. Mm -hmm. And then, once again, he's referring to his penis when he says there wasn't a Boy Scout issue? Yes. All right, so he's describing this sexual encounter with his wife to you? Yes. All right, so moving on to page 38, you see that's just a short email you to him. Mm-hmm. What time should I return home? Do you see that? Yes. All right, and then following that up, page 39, the subject being Oak Brook, 10, 12, 98, 4.07 p.m., an email from you to the defendant, 18.7 miles door to door, and no one from the home office is going up to help them open the office. There you go. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay, so are you and the defendant uh, continuing to plan this meetup surrounding the Oak Brook office opening? It looks that way, yes. All right, so now directing your attention to the next email string, beginning on page 41. Starting with an email from him to you, October 15th, 1998, 1026 AM. And then do you see your reply right above that? Yes. Okay. So in your reply, I'm not going to have you read the whole thing, but in your reply, you see the word watching TV there? Yes. And you say thinking about computers and boyfriends? Yes. Okay. Are you referencing how you communicate with the defendant? Yes. And then looking at the prior page, page 40, once again, are you continuing with the flirtatious emails? Yes. So you, this email at the top from the defendant to you, October 15th, 1998, 10.57 a.m., I do love you. Do you see that? At the top of 40? Um, the second email from the top? Yes. And then your response, I do love you too, always? Yes. All 
All right, so the next email string is a long email string, so I want to direct you to page 47. All right, so if you see this email string, does it start off with some uh, quotes that had been sent like a kind of like a chain email? Yes. All right, so right above that on page 47, it becomes just you communicating with the defendant, correct? Yes. All right, and so then on Friday, October 16th, 1998 at 921 a.m., he emails you, hey, want to run off somewhere? I do love you. Yes. All right, and how do you reply to that email? What sparked this bold attempt at messing with me? Sounds wonderful, where should we go? And how does he reply to that? Really bold attempt? If it was really bold, you'd have tickets for the Windstar in your hand. Doesn't take much to spark anything when it comes to you. What was that word again? Keep forgetting. You name it, you have the number, let me know. X. All right, so do you know what he's referring to, tickets for the Windstar? I think we had discussed um, that there was this cruise on the Windstar. It was a ship, and we had talked about how fun it would be to go. <laughs> so this is a cruise? Yes. Okay, and so then at the top of that page, what is your response to him? Tickets in hand, huh? What a good time of year to go on one of the, these fabulous trips. So you're asking him what's a good time to go? Yes. And then his response um, on the next page above that? Yep, with you any time of the year, but generally February to April when it's zero here and 80 there. And then what do you reply to that? What's it like in October? And he says? Don't know, would be fun to find out. All right, and so what is your response then? Considering you have a milestone birthday next year and we would both need some time to clean up our lives, so to speak, I was thinking what a lovely way to spend your birthday. You, me, sunsets, ocean, champagne, no outside issues. Okay, so um, was the defendant turning uh, 40 in October of 1999? Yes. So you're talking about a year from basically when these emails are happening? Yes. All right, and then in this email, you talk about... Um, we would both need some time to clean up our lives, so to speak. What were you referring to? Getting divorced. So obviously you know about his marriage, right? Right. And uh, you were married at this time. Yes. So you were thinking, I have to get divorced. Well, I'm thinking if we have to, if, we're, if we would, did the cruise, we'd have to be divorced, yes. So the cruise. So yeah, in the moment, yeah. So when you're considering whether this cruise can be a reality, you got to clean up your lives first. Right. And then you end with no outside issues. Are you referring to the same thing? Yes. Okay. Can't realistically go, to, go on a cruise with someone who's married when you're married? Right. All right. And then when, what was his response to that? That would be... I'm assuming a dream tr come true, which trip, when should I make the deposit? Okay, and your response? Ah, the commitment part. Well. And how does he respond? You have a problem with commitments. That's okay. I could probably find someone else to go if you changed your mind. Your response? Such as? <laughs> And he says? Uh, Kodak, he's my buddy. He would probably go. Don't know if they accept animals, though, or kids. Guess I'm screwed. 
Doug B wouldn't be the same, but we'd raise all kinds of hell. Okay, so Kodak's a dog. Yes. And then who is Doug B? Um, it was a friend of his, Doug Brandt. Um, and uh, did you come to know Doug Brandt eventually? Mm -hmm. Yes. And was Doug Brandt married to anyone? Yes. Do you know his wife's name? I believe it was Robin, but I can't swear to that. So your, your recollection was Robin was his wife's name? Yes. Um, and so were these friends of the defendants? Yes. And so he suggested this friend, Doug, if you couldn't make it? Yes. And the dog, too? Yeah. All right. And so how do you respond to that? It's good to know I'm so easily replaced. And he says... Whoa, didn't say you could be easily replaced, couldn't be replaced, wouldn't be the same, and I'd be screwed, or not, as the case may be. All right, so then what do you say to that? So let's say I have until the end of the year to decide one way or the other, and then in January you can send in the deposit if I'm still in. Dill? Okay, so you are actually seriously considering doing this. Yes. And was it your impression or belief that the defendant was also con seriously considering doing this? Yes. Um, and so then you suggest that if you're in in January, he can book it. Yes. So end of the year to decide. Right. So that would be the end of 1998. Yes. How does he respond? Fair enough, but no deadline on deciding. Whatever time it needs to be figured out. Okay, and how do you respond to that? And do you have it all figured out? What are you trying to find out? If he's planning on leaving his wife, I think. So how does he respond to that? I'm thinking so, barring seeing a bunch of disgusting habits I couldn't live with, but then you'd have a hard time topping the boys with all I've taught them. And if it just keeps getting better, some details to be worked out. But then those are just the details, not the big issue. An issue is way off to the side here. Yeah. Okay, you respond. It was the details I was wondering about. Disgusting habits, huh? Okay, so... Um, you appear to be inquiring what he is going to do about his details, correct? Yes. Um, and so the big issue being he's married. Right. And he's not giving you a response on what he's going to do. Right. Okay, so then how does he respond to that? Murphy spins on details. Details are just noise in the bigger picture, and yep, disgusting. Okay, and so now you continue to ask. And you plan on dealing with the details how? What kind of disgusting? He replies. One at a time. You reply. Evasive little shit. He wasn't answering your questions? Right. Okay, then what does he say to that? Ooh, she went to lunch and came back nasty. Not trying to be evasive, what exactly are you looking for? We can talk about the details, smile, you're cute when you smile, and other things. You reply? I didn't come back nasty, I'm usually like this. Okay, we'll discuss the details. I'm cute when I smile. Not trying to suck up, are you? Okay, then he says? Okay, you're cute when you try to burp. And you say? Nice way to avoid the subject. You're worse than me. Okay, so your impression still is he's not answering your question. Right. What he's going to do about his details. Okay, and so his reply to that? Okay, ask me about a detail. I'm not avoiding. You're not asking. I'm supposed to guess the question. Okay, I'll be Karnak. Okay. Your reply? You asked me if I wanted to run off with you somewhere. I'd love to, but there are issues we have to deal with. I'm not sure how I'll deal with my issue, thus the deadlines and agreements. 
for any backing out that might be necessary. Do you know how you'll deal with your issues, details, whatever? Okay. Um, and so at this point in time, mid-October of 1998, you were not yet sure that you wanted to divorce your husband. Right. Okay. And so that's why you don't want to make a firm commitment at this time. Right. And you set a deadline for yourself and for the defendant of the end of the year. Right. Okay, and so what is his reply? Our deadlines and agreement necessary, not trying to pin anything down, and I got my ticket punched, had that conversation, heard the answers, we're just hanging out for lack of one of us making a decision. Just need to decide what to do or make an announcement. What did you understand him to be saying there? Um, it sounded like he had talked to his wife and by him getting his ticket punched that she probably said she wasn't in love with him anymore and that they were just staying together for convenience at this point. So you believe he's talking about his relationship with his wife? Yes. Okay, then your response? Hmm, okay. Deadlines and agreements are necessary because I don't want to let you down. His response? Why? Your response? I do love you. His response? I do love you too. Your response? I know, thank you. And then finally, his response? Don't forget. Now moving up to the next page. Your response? Never. His response? Let me down how? Your response? By getting our hopes up and then backing out. His response? Either way, it'll be an always thing. You have to do what's right for you. I'll just be hanging out. Do you realize that you never use the word now, even in past ease? Hmm. Do you know what he's talking about there? I think we had an agreement that if I decided I was going to leave my husband, I would say now. And it would be like a, a code word or something. And what he told you is that it's an always thing. He'll just be hanging out. Yes. Basically waiting for you to do what's right for you. Yes. Okay. So what do you say to that? Uh, what would change if I did, and I really haven't had a need for it, now have I? Okay. And then now some joke about you putting the word now in there. Right. All right, so here, your response to him at 1.13 p.m., what do you say? Wondered if you catch it very good, but you haven't answered my question. And how does he respond to that? What would change? Some things. Still respectful of messing with your deal. Rather than thinking all about the fun stuff, start planning the fun stuff. Wouldn't be letting three, four, six weeks go by. Hasn't been a problem lately, though. <laughs> All right, so the next email would be on page 51. And in that email, from October 19th. Do you see a reference to Dawn? How yes. Is Dawn? Yes. Um, was that Dawn Cooper? Yes. Was she your friend? Yes. Um, where did she work? She worked at Stiefel in the same office that I did. <clears throat> okay, so now moving on to the next email. This would be page 52. kind of hard to see the date. Are you able to read that, the date there? Yes. And what, what is the date? 
uh, the 20th of October. And that's for both of them? Yes. All right, so in this email, are you essentially talking about um, your husband, Mark Greenman? <clears throat> yes. Yes. Okay, so that's what most of the email is about? Yes. All right, now at the end of the email, you say, looking forward to Friday, smiling and laughing will be good for me, some time off from the tension, eh? Talk to you soon, I do love you. Yes. Okay, so this being October 20th of 1998, that Friday would be the Chicago trip, right? Yes, oh yes, yes. All right, so the next string of emails directing your attention to page 54. All right, so you see that email from you. This would be the 19th of October. Subject, he called? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so nice as can be, he's going to Denver the 12th of November, which probably put him in a good mood. So now he's getting over being upset with me. I'm not sure where to go from here. Who were you talking about? My husband at the time. Okay. So um, I'm not sure where to go from here. What do you mean by that? probably just having mixed emotions about whether I want to stay with him or leave him. And he apparently has a trip the 12th of November. Yes. Okay. And you see this email from the defendant to you, the reply, BC question mark, just a thought. Did you smile? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. BC, was he referring to Big Cedar? Yes. And then, once again, him emailing you, now October 25th, 5.02 p.m. So what do you think? Is that correct? Yes. So you reply that you're thinking about it? Yes. And he replies, let me know. I'll see if I can get the HM cabin again. I want you. Is that correct? Yes. Do you know what the reference to HM cabin was? I'm not sure. I think it might have stood for honeymoon cabin. All right. So now moving up that page, talking about days and the timing of it. Right. And then same on the beginning of the next page. Yes. All right, and then towards the top there of this page, he's talking about going fishing. Yes. All right, so I want to direct your attention to another um, email thread. This is beginning on page 60. So actually to see the beginning of that email, um, go to page 59. Okay, so do you see this email from yourself to the defendant, October 20th, 1998? Yes. Okay, so once again, in this email, are you describing your husband and issues with your husband? Yes.
All right, so now I want to direct your attention to the top of page 59. All right, and to see the from for that email, you have to go to the bottom of the prior page. Okay. So do you see that email is from you? Yes. And then that's October 20th to the defendant? Yes. Okay, and you say this is special, but I was talking about seeing the light with my husband and myself. Did yes. Okay, so um, do, at this time period, did you continue to be conflicted about whether to remain with your husband or not? Yes. All right, and then the defendant responds, just notice that you're still Labonte, oops, and Gree. I get it from, the, from Labonte, and it goes to Gree and then M. Get your point. Do you see that? Yes. So he was inquiring about whether you had changed your name. On the emails, I believe. Some of the emails say Kelly Labani. Some of them say Kelly Greenman. So, for instance, the email we were just looking at, that says Kelly Greenman. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And the email above that, is that you explaining about that guy who had been emailing you? I think so, yes. Just talking about it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, at the very end of that email, you make some reference to moving to a new town or getting another job. Do you see that? Yes. All right. Then you see the email from the defendant to yourself, the 11.33 a.m. email. Two ideas, smaller Midwestern towns, and they don't include Denver. Yes. You say, how about Joplin, Missouri? Yes. He says, been there at 4 a.m., not much there. <laughs> nope. Yes. You say Springfield, Il Illinois? Yes. He says, nope. How about Ken slash RAC? Do you see that? Yes. What did he mean by that? Kenosha Racine. You say, never heard of it? Yes. He says, see, no one would ever find you? Yes. Your reply, good point. Hope you could, though? Yes. Then he says, wouldn't be a problem, even in the dark? Yes. All right, so then going to the next email thread. <clears throat> this would begin on page 62. All right, so for this email, Tuesday, October 20th, 1998, 9.42 a.m., the subject you see is uh, short blue cocktail dresses. Mm, is that yes, correct? Yes. All right. And so you are suggesting to the defendant about uh, bringing a short blue cocktail dress. I don't know if that's what we're talking about. I don't. I don't know exactly what the headline's about. But in terms of the text of that first email, you say maybe I'll bring the green one too, and you can decide which I should wear. Possibly, yes. Okay, and then his response, how could I possibly decide that? Okay, wear both. Would the green one be the one that he said makes you look like a working girl? Is that correct? Yes. 
Okay. So again, this being October 20th of 1998, you're planning your meetup with him in Chicago, right? Yes. Okay. So this email thread starting looking at page 62 and then going into page 61, um, this is you talking about what you're going to bring to where, right? Yes. And then more of the um, flirtatious banter between yes. both of you? Yes. Okay. Leading up to the weekend? Yes. All right, so the next email thread beginning on page 66. All right, so now if we look at this email from the defendant to you, and this is Sunday, October 25th, 1998, 5.31 p.m. Do you see that email? Yes. Okay. So now if you're thinking about the timeline of things, this would be the end of the weekend that you were in Chicago together, correct? Right. Yes. Okay, so the email reads, so I have this question. Remember, don't tell me what I want. So what do you really think? Do you see that? Is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, and then your response? What do I think about what? Okay, and what does he say in response to that? Remember what don't tell me was in relation to? Just wondering if you had given that any more thought, if it would be an issue, if you'd be okay with it, if whatever. Thought I'd toss it up in the air and see what came back down. Wasn't that the crush conversation in Columbus? That was at a time when I wasn't at this point with this. Okay. Now, to see the to from part, you got to go to the previous page. But the next email is from you, now under the name Kelly Greeman, mm -hmm. to the defendant. And then what do you say in your reply? I think it would be a piece of cake and a joy taking on all three of you. Okay, so what is this email thread about? Um, in a previous phone conversation, there had been a comment made about how I wouldn't want to be with somebody with two kids. And I said, don't tell me what I would or wouldn't want, something to that effect. And so this is the follow-up to that conversation. Yes. And based on your response, you were telling him that you'd be receptive to that. It would yes. be a piece of cake and a joy. Yes. Okay, and then his response to that, <coughs> that got me laughing, piece of cake and a joy, taking on all three. You know, I can see that. I think you'd be able to handle three or four, as the case may be. Got pics from Doug and Robin of the new edition. Think that you'd be good for them too. So is the defendant once again referencing his friends, Doug and Robin? Yes. And he says something about a new edition. Do you know what he's talking about there? Not specifically. They may have just had their baby. Okay. And you know that they did have a baby? Yes. And was it around this general time period, if you know? I can't remember if it was right around then or if it was earlier. So then looking at your response above. Then yes, the, it must have been the baby. Okay. So okay. you say don't want to take on Doug, Robin, and the baby too, though. Right. Okay, so that would be Doug and Robin's baby? Yes. Now, a little bit further up in this email chain, you have an email to the defendant on October 26, 1998, 10.33 a.m. So you're kind of talking about 
yourself not feeling really well, feeling funky today? Yeah. All right. And then in this email, you referenced yesterday was weird with Mark. Yes. Okay. So once again, you're talking to the defendant about uh, the person who was your current husband, Mark y Freeman. Yes. And you're just relating your frustrations with that? Yes. Okay, so then if you just look at through the rest of this email chain, are you just continuing to talk to the defendant about uh, the issues with your husband? Yes. All right, so moving to the next email chain, beginning on page 67. <coughs> so you see these lower emails on this page 67. They're the repeats of the prior emails about don't tell me what to do. You see that? Yes. So that's about taking it, taking on him and the kids, essentially? Right. Okay, so this top email, October 26, 1998, 11, 11 p.m. What does he tell you in this top email? That he likes my answer that it would be a piece of cake or did you want me to read it um yes why don't you read his whole response okay. we kind of got off on a tangent there so wanted to come back to this i like that answer taking on could be the appropriate ver verbiage i do love you okay so he's going back to the prior emails saying you got off on a tangent yes but he likes your answer yes All right, now looking at the next email chain, page 69. <clears throat> Do you see that bottom email from him to you at 1.09 p.m.? Yes. All right, so he references sending you some money for the phone. Um, what is that? What is he talking about there? Yes, he was talking about sending me money for the phone. Okay, and so that's what you testified to earlier, that the cell phone bill yes. was getting high? Yes. So back in 1998, different. It was a per minute charge. So if you talked more on the phone, you were getting charged more? Yes. And for you, because you talked to him so much, the bills were getting big? Yes. All right, and so... Your response to that is basically, you're too good sometimes? Yes. All right, and then his reply, we didn't guess it's my deal with this, like opening a door for a GF, how and why. I was just sitting there, and there she was, and the more I talked to her, the better it got. Is that correct? Yes. All right, what is GF? Girlfriend. All right, so now looking at the next email, page 70. All right, so he's asking you once again about 
your email changing? Well, this says, do you get things in the mail that are addressed? Oh, okay, so you think it's the actual mail? <laughs> yeah. And then your response is, yes, it's very weird, but getting used to it? Yes. The name change? And his response is, does Labonte still work? I'll change the name. Do you see yeah. that? Yes. And then your response is for what? Mail, yes. Email, no. Anything else? Is that correct? Yes. Um, now looking at the next email string beginning on page 72. All right, so looking at these emails, is this a continuation of the um, online shopping at Patagonia? <clears throat> is that correct? Yeah, I'm looks sorry. like that, yes. All right, and so then Along those lines on that topic, the defendant says to you on October 26, 1998 at 12.22 p.m., understand, I know, but hey, I'm having fun, no strings, well, maybe just one for whoever, and that would only be being there. Think I could warm you up. Remember I said I'd give you anything. If you can't try to spoil your GF a little, what's, what the hell? I do love you. Yes. And so, once again, he refers to you as his girlfriend? Yes. All right, and then just looking at the prior page of emails, does that continue some flirtatious comments? Yes. All right, so now turning to page 75. So once again, we're on the Patagonia emails. Do you see that? Yes. And it appears this, this email from you to the defendant, 10-26-98, p.m. Um, you're essentially picking out an item? Yes. Okay, for $119? Yes. And then you talk about how you're not good at asking for things? Yes. Okay, and then the next email on page 76. Just quickly, it looks like, looks like some kind of draft of the prior emails. Yes. And then page 77. Okay, so this email, this is from October 27th of 1998, 11.32 a.m., um, from you to the defendant. Do you see in this email how you make a reference to finally getting the details taken care of for Blueprint and BM meeting? Yes. Okay, so this Blueprint, you're talking about the conference that's going to occur? Yes. And given that this was October 27th, um, this conference is in a week or so? Yes. Now, what was your role for the Blueprint Conference? I was um, 
a coordinator or liaison with the hotel to make sure the the meeting rooms um, everything was working and just making sure it ran smoothly <clears throat> and so um, you lived in st. Louis and this conference was in st. Louis right yes um, but would you be staying at the hotel yes okay because of your role making sure everything runs smoothly yes Okay, so now looking at the next page, page 78. All right, so do you see this email in the middle of the page from the defendant to you, October 27th, 1998, 319 p.m.? What, is the def what does the defendant say to you? Family, or at least David, yep, real good is great. There is no real perfect and real good can be real easy, or at least that's what I remember. And then how do you respond to him above that? I said, have you talked to her about it yet, or are you just going to bang her over the head, drag her out to the car, and tell her she's going to have a good time? Remember the caveman days? All right, and do you know what this is in reference to? Um... I think it was when he was going to take his family on like a, a little trip, maybe a weekend getaway, and I don't think she wanted to go, but he was going to try to get her to go. All right, so that's what he was telling you about what was going on? I think so. And to be clear, you've never talked to Julie Johnson? No. All right, finally... The last email string. So this will begin on page 80. So this is an email from yourself to the defendant, October 27th, 1998, 10, a.m. Um, and I'm going to ask you to read the entirety of this email. He said <clears throat> he was up all night frustrated and mad because I have shut myself off from him these last three or so weeks. He asked me if there was someone else, if I still wanted to be married, and what was going on with me. At 5.30 a.m. in half a voice, I was hardly in any shape to battle with him, but I did realize I need to give this a fair shot or get the hell out. I've decided to give it a fair shot first. A six-year relationship that I have fought tooth and nail for and a one-month marriage deserves at least one bold effort. Anyway, I would very much like your support on this. Your friendship means so much to me, maybe too much for the sake of my marriage. Obviously, because... BC is out for now. Maybe someday when the cards are working for us, we can do that together. One, I don't feel right about going right now. And two, I have a lot to do, and those few days to myself would be a great help. I know things have been funky, but he did notice that I've been funky too and suspected one of the issues. For my own peace of mind, I need to focus on the positives of this marriage and see what happens. So let me know your thoughts on this, please. I do love you always, really. Okay, so what were you telling the defendant with this email? That I was going to focus on working on my marriage. And so that was your decision on October 27th of 1998? Yes. Okay. Now, in here, you made some reference. Obviously, BC is out for now. Yes. Is that the reference to Big Cedar? Yes. And how your husband was going to be gone November 12th? Right. Um, so now your plan was to not go somewhere with the defendant during that time period? Correct. So were you actually able to in any way rehabilitate your um, marriage? Not really. I mean, maybe for a few days, but it didn't, it didn't really take. <laughs> so this commitment that you are expressing in this October 27th email, it didn't last long? No, two, three weeks, maybe. And so... I mean, we stayed together through Christmas, but it wasn't... It was obvious it wasn't working. 
by what time were you out of not living in the same home as your husband? Um, I moved out sometime in January 99. of 99, yes. Now, between this email and January of 99, did you continuously communicate with the defendant? Yes. All right, so um, looking at his reply, October 27th, 1998, hey, fair enough, you never did say now. My support, you've always got that, Kelly. Only concern I have is for the funky and you and you being okay, but not going there now. Whatever happens, I really hope that you're that happy little camper. I do love you always. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> All right, and can you read your response back to him? As long as I have your friendship and support, I'll be fine, because I know if the funky gets out of hand, you'll be there for me. I hope we can still enjoy our fun emails and talks. You just need to bring it down a notch, if you know what I mean. Wanted to comment on something you said yesterday about my eyes. It's a control thing for me. I feel myself enjoying myself with you and being happy, and then I start falling, realize it, catch myself, and pull back. It's a protection thing only in the sense that the timing for falling isn't quite right if you get my drift. Happy little camper, cute phrase. All right, and then his response to you is, wow, you've got the friends and support thing. I'll be there one way or another. See a Dear John letter of sorts. Just kidding, we can bring it down a notch. Have wondered at times over the last month what was going to happen with your situation. Just last night mentioned quitting Stiefel before doing anything. Things were real funky. It was either going to hit the wall or there was going to be a decision to regroup, so to speak, and see if it was going to work. Makes sense. Like I said a while back, I could see how this was going to play out. Denver, etc. Wouldn't it be ironic if the bottom doesn't fall out of the box and the woman nose dives or the bottom does fall or the bottom does and the woman gets fixed or just think of all the permutations and understand the I thing if the falling is what I think it is. Was that accurate? Yes. And you respond to him? I'm sure the falling is what you think. We always seem to be on the same page when it's us involved. Have faith, Mark. It'll all come together eventually. What's the wow for? And then his response to you is, yep, I think we are on the same page with the eyes. I'm a little confused. What will come together eventually? This or wherever the pieces happen to fall. The wow is for, I hope we can still enjoy our fun emails and talks. You just seem to be questioning the friends part. Is that accurate? Yes. <clears throat> so again, to be clear, that email didn't actually end your relationship with the defendant? Correct. Um, so these emails that you've looked at um, in this exhibit, um, do they accurately reflect uh, the emails that were sent between yourself and the defendant? Yes. Um, so I would move that into evidence. I believe it's Exhibit 21. 21? All right. Be subject to cross. Are you done? Um, I am not done with my direct examination. I'm, I'm not pushing. I was just asking. Okay. I am done with that Thanks. exhibit. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> now, I just have a few follow-up questions on what we learned from the emails. Um, so during that Chicago trip, that was um, around October 23rd of 1998. Um, do you recall going to Morton's Steakhouse? I don't recall it, but that sounds like something we would do. Okay, so you don't recall going to that specific restaurant? Correct. Okay. What about Adler Planetarium? Um, no, I don't think I've been to the planetarium.
Now, if you recall the email um, where you called the defendant evasive, um, did the defendant ever specifically say what he was going to do about his marriage? No. All right, so I want to direct your attention to the Blueprint Conference, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so you were at that conference and you were at the hotel, correct? Yes. Okay, and the Friday evening of that conference, was there a big dinner? Yes. And is that for the brokers? Yes. Okay, um, and so what did you do after the dinner? After the dinner, some of the brokers, um, there was a bar there at the hotel, and some of the, some of the brokers went there, and that's where I was, and other employees. And so we went there and hung out for a while, listened to the music. Okay, and while you were there, um, are you describing like a bar area? Yes. Okay, and so were people drinking at the bar? Yes. Um, was the defendant there? Was it, yes. Okay, um, and during this time period, so this would be the weekend of November 7th, is this the time period where you were still trying to, to get back together with your husband or repair that relationship? Yes. Okay, was your husband with you? Yes. And was he also in the bar area? He was in the bar area, yes. Was he with you the whole time at the bar? No, he sat kind of separate from the other group. So I'd go back and forth. I'd go sit and talk to him, and then I'd go and talk to the group. And the group that you're referring to, that included the defendant? Yes. Now, how would you describe your behavior with the defendant? Um, friendly, flirty. But low-key, um, I guess that's how I would describe it. Okay, so still flirty with him? Yeah. Now, during this time period when people were in this bar area, um, you mentioned you and the defendant. Do you remember any other people who were there? I know Don Cooper was there and Ed Klug, and I don't. Rec I think there were a few others, but I don't recall who they were. Okay, and so while you were talking, um, everyone in that particular group were, was talking, do you recall any conversations being brought up about penises? No. Are you saying that that did not happen or that you don't recall? I don't recall. Um, now, between yourself and the defendant, had you had conversations um, about penises? Probably. All right, so before we get to uh, those questions, questions related to that, I just want to uh, continue with that night at the bar. Um, at that, that evening, do you recall when you would have left the bar area? Um, I don't recall exactly when, but um, I was, I do believe I was one of the first ones to go. Okay, so your recollection is when you left the bar area, other people, the other people you've named were there? Yes. And did you leave the bar area with your husband? Yes. And did you go up to your room? Yes. So as far as what happened after that, you couldn't tell us? That is correct. <clears throat> okay, so during the course, let's talk about the early times during your relationship with the defendant. Okay. During those early few months, let's say September, October, after the sexual relationship has started, did the defendant ever question you about prior sexual partners? Um, we just, we discussed them and he would ask um, questions. They were fairly high level. Um, I can't, I can't give you any examples. I just, I just know that it was always here and there, but every now and again, yeah, there would be questions and conversations about it. Okay, and so he expressed wanting to know about prior sexual experiences you had had? Yes. Okay, even at that time in your relationship? Yes. Okay, now, um, when you were having those discussions, did you ever bring up um, an individual who worked in Colorado? I believe so, yes. And who was that person? Uh, his name is Jock Joseph. Did you actually have um, 
sex with that person? No, not to the best of my knowledge. Okay, but had you seen him naked? Yes. And had he been trying to have sex with you? Yes. Um, and did the defendant ask you about his penis, this man's penis? I believe so, yes. And when you referred to these discussions being high level, can you describe what you mean about these initial discussions? They would just be, you know, just kind of a one question at a time kind of thing. We'd be having a conversation maybe about the fact that, you know, I... I'd gone out with this guy, and yes, we had sex, and then there would be a question about it, and then we'd move on. And then later, he'd come back to it and ask another question about it. And so it wasn't, you know, it didn't seem like a big deal at the time. It was just kind of a weird question in the middle of a conversation. Um, and so that was at the beginning, mm -hmm. and so as the years progressed in your relationship, did that change? Yes. Okay. Now, before we move on to that, I just want to clarify the time frame of this encounter you would have had with John Jock Joseph. Do you recall what that time frame would have been? I know it was the branch manager's meeting, um, so it was probably about a year prior to the branch manager's meeting that we were having in 98, so probably sometime in 97. Okay. Okay, so then um, as time progressed in terms of your relationship with the defendants, so I'm talking now 1999, 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. um, did he begin asking you extremely detailed questions about your prior sexual partners? Yes. Um, and <clears throat> did he specifically ask for each of your partners about their penises? Yes. And did he ask you to describe their penises in detail? Yes. Would that include things like length? Yes. Width? Yes. And then would he also ask you in detail about uh, sexual encounters that you had had with the prior partners? Yes. So I've showed you what has been marked as state's exhibit number 22. Um, do you see handwriting on that page? Yes. Do you recognize whose handwriting that is? Yes. Whose handwriting is it? It's the defendant's marks. Um, and then if you page through this document, this document is a, quite a few pages, so I'm not asking you to read every page to yourself or, or out loud or anything like that. I'm just asking you to page through the document. Okay, so now that you've had a chance to page through that document, um, does that appear to be in the defendant's handwriting uh, detailed notes about the sexual encounters you had told him about? Yes. 
And um, that very first page, does that have a note about John Jock Joseph? Yes. Now, when you were having these conversations, were you aware that the defendant was taking notes? No. Um, and so are you saying that he was not face-to-face -face with you? Correct. So it was only at a later time that you discovered that these notes existed? <laughs> yes. Now, um, these are extraordinarily unusual conversations, correct? Yes. Um, and to be clear, you are not the person who brought up this topic. Correct. Okay. It was the defendant asking you these questions. Yes. Now, as when you were paging through this document, did you see um, pages that had actual uh, like hand drawings on them? Yes. 